the vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 39 of the Warrant Articles and Motions document. The Planning Board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 27, 2017. The board voted unanimously on April 12, 2017 to recommend that town meeting adopt the change. This article came to the Zoning Advisory Committee from the Design Review Board. They had recently uh, seen some signs on the second floor of buildings that just didn't look right. They just don't look like they belong there from a design perspective. So they asked that these changes be made. It is the intent that prohibiting signs all the way up on all the walls in the commercial area would uh, impose a design aesthetic that is consistent with how we want our uh, commercial districts to look. So basically this is going to allow uh, signs to be on the first floor on our commercial districts. It does not uh, uh, prohibit a sign up on the top of a industrial building. Uh, basically our industrial buildings are adjacent to 495 and uh, we think that that's in keeping with keeping our, our corporate citizens some visibility uh, and you see that basically all up and down 495 and we want to keep ourselves competitive with other communities. Are there any questions for Mr. Weissmail? Hi, Alana Cassidy, uh, 19 Eastview Road. Um, I want to ask, is it just for the buildings on South Street, those types of buildings, or like the new buildings on, um, like which buildings is it for? Because this just says building. It doesn't say what type of building. Okay. Good question. Uh, this is for commercial buildings, so it would be downtown commercial buildings, rural business district, uh, the Price Chopper Plaza, uh, the industrial buildings, which is South Street and Lumber Street Parkwood Drive, they can have the, uh, the signs uh, up on the top of, of the building. So basically, uh, the hotel district is, is located in one of the industrial areas, and it could have a sign appropriately up the top. But it's the smaller, I'll say, downtown businesses uh, that would not have signs on the second floor. Mr. Bonnery, is it uh, okay to ask uh, yes. to comment on it? Okay. So, Lana Cassidy, 19 East Road. Um, I would just like to say that I am against this motion then as a, a family member of a small business owner who actually has a business on the second floor. The sign is a way for us, for people to see a small business. And I think as a town, if we are looking to bring businesses into our town, if we are going to be um, limiting the visual, the, our, the way that we promote our business, I think it's really gonna have businesses not wanna be here. So if we wanna bring business into our town, why make more regulations for them? And as a small business, I think it's very hard for a small business survive, to survive without that extra um, advertising. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. Bonnery, Clifford Kistner, 86 West Main Street, Hopkinton, Mass. Um, I think that our plan on the planning board was to um, keep it more of that, um, you know, the mash type sign um, ensemble throughout the town uniformly to, to give more of a hometown feel rather than this construct of, of signage everywhere. Um, we, we looked at uh, legacy farms and thought about their signage for roads and things like that. And I understand the value of business exposure, um, but I, I do think that there's some quaintness associated to uh, the, the, the way that the signs are at eye level or thereabouts, and that um, they're grouped together for the unity of the building itself as a, as a, as a, a placket, more or less, 
and then just I'm in um, pr um, pr I, I would like for this to go forward because of that reason um, I do understand that this is basically for the downtown area and it uh, there has <coughs> we're working on taking the telephone lines down and and changing the demographics of the of what the town looks like in the first place and I think in the overall aspect of the master plan in the end what we've tried to do um, will reveal itself as being a benefit to all businesses in the downtown area thank you um, I have two questions for mr. Weissmetal on this is there retroactive application uh, if there is an existing sign that's uh, in conflict with this, if it passes, is that permitted, or would would the sign have to be removed? That's the first question. First, uh, the signs would be, Mr. Moderator, the signs would be grandfathered. This is a zoning amendment, so the grandfathering would allow those ex existing signs to uh, remain. And the second question is, is there a special permit or variance process for someone who, uh, in the future, would like to um, do something that would be contrary to the language of this uh, bylaw I, I believe it would, would if you wanted something other than this it would require a special permit from the Board of Appeals thank you could I ask another question sure okay. Lana Cassidy 19 Eastby Road doesn't the Planning Board already have in place um, that you have to go through and get a permit to get your sign like isn't that already in place Mr. Weissmetal. The process is that a applicant for a sign goes to uh, the design review board. Uh, they hold a hearing on the sign request and the design review board uh, gives an advisory op opinion to the building inspector. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, then uh, let's vote on this. All those in favor of Article 39 as uh, presented in the motions and in the warrant article, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, uh, because this is, uh, well. Okay. This is clearly a two-thirds majority, and so it passes. On to Article 40, public consumption of tetrahydrocannabinol. <clears throat> Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Mr. Catino. We move that the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 40 of the annual town meeting warrant. And an explanation? Yeah, this, uh, this article is, uh, is mostly administrative. Um, it adjusts the fines and the like, and it uh, also fixes uh, some spelling of the word marijuana. <laughs> it uh, reduces the fine from, I believe, 300 to $100 in line with the new state regulations. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of this article as presented signify by saying aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. <clears throat> Article 41, minutes of public bodies. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Mr. C Mr. Sestari. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this article is just pro um, proposing to set time frames for which uh, uh, public bodies need to submit the minutes to their meetings. Uh, currently, there is no time frame that's defined. We want to set a time frame that is not too stringent, but nonetheless uh, makes it a requirement that these uh, meetings are uh, noted publicly and have those minutes accessible uh, to the public as well. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Moderator, Mr. Sestari will read the motion for the article. See if the town will vote to amend Chapter 5, Boards, Committees, and Commissions of the General Bylaws of the Town of Hopkinton by adding a uh, new Article 8 entitled Minutes of Public Bodies as follows. Excuse 
excuse me, Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry. The, uh, the motion is uh, we move that the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 41 of the annual town meeting warrant. Questions? Sandy Altamira, um, 33 Elm Street. Um, I'm chairman of the uh, trust funds, and we've had um, one of our members, it's a three-member board, has had a stroke, and she's uh, the secretary. And she's also had a great deal of trouble with her, with her computer. Now, we've got most of the minutes up to date, but we can't always, we've had trouble getting them. Um, what happens if we can't get them? I mean, I, I think having a timely manner to expect the minutes is one thing. I'm not sure I'm on board with this. Mr. Moderator, Mr. the town manager would like to respond. Okay. Good evening, town meeting. Uh, through the town moderator, if any town board or committee has any problems producing minutes, please contact my office. Uh, just kind of a follow-up. So that would be allowed um, if, we, if we do have medical, a medical difficulty or a technical difficulty getting the, the newest minutes to you we could have some sort of a, a, of a waiver or a grace period? In fact, the reason for contacting the town manager's office is to make sure that we work out a solution to get the minutes done. Fine. What if we can't do it within the 40 days? Through you, Mr. Moderator. We haven't decided the penalties yet. <laughs> Police, chief. Yeah. Police chief has your address. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Herr. There will no, be no penalties for Sandy Altamira. <laughs> <laughs> On my left, Pam Waxlags. Pam Waxlags, 15 Smith Road. I have a question uh, first. With the document management system, is that retained permanently and can be considered permanent records of the board and committee minutes? Mr. Kamalo? Through the town moderator, um, I'm, I'm looking back at the IT director. I, I believe ESDMS is a permanent record so long as we have access to the servers. And whether that qualifies as a permanent record, I'll defer to the town clerk for his official position. Mr. Deegan. It is not a permanent record by state standard of the permanent record. So a uh, physical document would still need to be kept, but the, custod the original custodian of the record would still be the border committee. This just allows for uh, more accessibility to residents who want to find minutes and decisions of meetings. May I have a follow-on question? Go ahead. How do we keep the permanent records as secretary of a committee and trying to figure out what do I do should I move on? <laughs> so you would still be required to keep the minutes or someone or pass them on to the next secretary in that instance. Um, for if you're asking about dissolving committees, then oh no, not that. I'd need to check on that. But um, for ones that are still ongoing, you would hold on to them as the actual custodian by the open meeting law. Okay, finally, I would like to speak in support of this article. Um, I've had many difficulties over the few, last few years finding minutes in the, on the town website or in the document management system. And it's often resulted with me trying, having to go outside and around to find it and having them available in one place, either the town clerk's office or the document management system will help tremendously. On my right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mary Jo Andrickin, 2 College Street. Uh, Mr. Moderator, may I respectfully ask the maker of the motion, uh, once minutes are amended and approved, why in the computer age does it take 10 days to convey it to the town clerk? Why can't the minutes just be emailed to, to Mr. Deegan? Mr. Kamalo? Through you, Mr. Moderator. 
uh, in discussing this specific provision, uh, we took into account a couple things. One, that there are town boards that are not supported to st by staff, uh, and also there are town board members uh, who may not have access to a computer, and we felt that uh, 10 days was sufficient time. On my left. Anne Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, I'm not sure who can answer this question, but through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the assumption is that once they go to the clerk, they're uh, made available to the public. Is that correct? Once a record comes to the clerk's office, it is then a public record and anyone may access it. But I guess my question then is, uh, Mr. Moderator, is how do we access it? Through you, Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. Uh, you may access it by either making a formal request to the town clerk's office or because uh, part of this bylaw change would allow this to go directly to the document management system, that would allow you to then search for it freely. On um, the town website. On the yes. Okay. This is probably outside of this uh, particular motion, but accessing uh, minutes on the town website is not an easy task. You can't find them. You search for a particular thing and you get about 400 different hits for it and then you have to scroll through each and every one of them. So I'm hoping that, <laughs> I'm hoping that this is going to be uh, part of an ongoing uh, upgrade to this whole system so that we're able to get the town, uh, minutes of particular boards in a much more timely mm. fashion. Personally, I support this, this article. I think 50 days from the time of the meeting till the time a citizen can access it is more than generous. I, I think we should recognize as well, some boards only do meet once a month and, and sometimes uh, I, during the yes. summer, not even, you know, not even that frequently. So I, I think yeah. uh, these dates were chosen in hopes that they would be beat, but recognizing that some boards simply uh, can't meet it as a result of their meeting schedules. But. Yes, and I think that's terrific, but for boards like the planning and assessors and that meet regularly, those should be more easily accessible. Mm -hmm. That's my concern about And I think Mr. Kamala will take under advisement that uh, the ability to access it electronically is something that should be examined okay. you know, more carefully. On my left. Uh, I've heard the question asked a couple times, but no answer. W what happens if committees don't comply? Mr. Herr. Mr. Kamala. <laughs> <laughs> there is no penalty. Thank you. On my right. Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street. Uh, on the I've been on a couple of committees where, uh, one, we had staff, so that it was done very timely. Uh, on the second committee, I was on the school building committee. For the first year, we didn't have staff writing the minutes, so uh, two volunteers, myself and the clerk at that time, wrote all the minutes. We would have them written you know, within a day of the meeting finished. Uh, we always got them sent to town hall uh, right after the next meeting when the, when the committee approved them. Uh, now we have uh, staff writing the minutes for that building committee. Uh, but in the past six months to a year, the process has fallen apart. We write the minutes on time, we approve them at our next meeting, we send them to town hall, and as the town clerk explained, they may be stamped in a public record then, but it can be weeks before they show up on the website. Uh, so I think there's something broken. And I also want to kind of reiterate it. it, it to, the, to the citizens looking for information, it, it's not a joke to ask, what is the penalty? Boards should be held accountable. They should be provided, the, the staff in town hall should be held accountable as well. If they need investment in tools or resources, they should be provided that. But the citizens deserve the minutes to be posted in a timely manner. The, the dates and times here, if there are no penalties, then why not be more aggressive on the posting times? 
if we're going to say within 10 days, which is more than generous, why not have some kind of provision that boards be held accountable if there's more than a certain number of uh, offenses, then they stand to be removed from the board or committee. Thank you. Mr. Kamalo? Yeah, through the town moderator, to, to be clear, in terms of the bylaw proposed, there is no penalty. However, under open meeting law, there has been case law where boards have been fined for not producing minutes on time, and uh, with your permission, town council can comment on this issue. Norman is correct. The, um, uh, there, in the last couple of years, have been revisions um, uh, to both the public records law and the open meeting law. The uh, requirements for projection of minutes under the open meeting law uh, have resulted in, um, in fines being imposed at the state level. Uh, we don't, uh, there isn't a firm standard. It depends on how frequently um, the particular board or committee meets, but um, it, it seems to be clear that if minutes are not produced in around six weeks, uh, they could result in a penalty at the state level. Um, the, uh, this bylaw was written without uh, an additional penalty uh, because we, uh, the, the initial goal is to set a standard and see how people can, can comply with it. If, they're, if it turns out that compliance is not um, as good as we hope, um, there's plenty of opportunity at a later time to impose a penalty. On my right. Connie Wright, 25 Amherst Road. I took a quick look at a couple other town, um, uh, what they do with their minutes. And one of the things, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted here. Can you wait till I'm done, please? <laughs> Um, I, sorry. Um, one of the, uh, a lot of the other towns require, instead of the first section A, they simply say at the next meeting, and then they give 10 days, full stop, not 10 days and then 10 days. So I guess I'm curious why we have the 40 days or at the next meeting, whichever is later, because why would we give a committee that meets every two weeks 40 days to get its minutes in when each and every meeting it needs to review the minutes of the meeting before? Am I missing something on that 40 days, why we do that? If It's either your next meeting, you have to approve minutes, and then you submit them to the town clerk. Why would you give an extra Mr. Herr? There are some committees that only meet once a month. There are some committees that only meet once a quarter. There's only some committees that meet once a year. Um, so we're trying to, what we're trying to do here, folks, uh, I see the mole or the mountain getting built here pretty quickly. We're trying to tighten up the requirements for the submission of meet minutes. We're not trying to be punitive. We don't want to be punitive. There's no need to be punitive. We're all volunteers. We're trying to tighten, tighten it up, set an expectation, and see how it goes. If I, the next year everyone's typing 365, trying to turn in their minutes, we'll do something a little bit different to adjust. But let's not make this bigger than it needs to be. Thank you. Um, so you missed my point. Uh, it's not the one. Me. I'm sorry, Mr. Moderator. Um, my point is not the ones that meet once a year, but the committees that meet every two weeks. This mm -hmm. actually gives them permission in this wording to take 40 days. So my point is, if you're meeting once a week or once every two weeks, you approve meeting minutes from the meetings before, and those should be submitted within 10 days as opposed to a 40-day window. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm just saying, why the 40 days? It should be next meeting and then 10 days to submit. Should I propose an amendment? I don't know how to do this now. <coughs> I mean, is there any response to that, Mr. Herr? 
Yeah, I, I, we hear what you're saying. Uh, again, we're just trying to tighten this up a little bit because right now we have nothing. But so if you have an amendment, I would encourage well, you to make the amendment to this, so, to so, this article. So Mr. No. Moderator, in keeping with Brian, and I think I'm actually in violent agreement with you, Brian, um, but all I'm saying is if you have groups that meet more frequently, you've given them a 40-day pass. I, I would, so, we understand the point you've made. Okay. I would suggest that if you, if you so, feel strongly about, enough about it, um, step aside for a minute, write up an amendment, I, and it, submit, it to the, submit it to us. It's very simple. Well, it has to be written. It, do you, is, that, is that required, that it has to be written? Yes. Because I've yes. seen in the past we've dictated. But, no, it okay. has to be written. Fine. I, I will write it up and submit it. It's just deleting the 40 days and next meeting. Yep. On, on my left. Oh, by the way, we have, we do have a roving mic for anyone who is uh, unable to get to the front mics. So if if someone has a, you know comment to offer or question to to pose and and they feel that they're unable to get to the front mics, please uh, let Muriel know and we'll get a mic to you. On my left, Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Planning Board has extensive minutes. They're very detailed, particularly in the public hearing process. We try our best to approve them at the next meeting, but sometimes our staff, who does an excellent job of writing the minutes, I mean really good job, takes a week of vacation, or other people in the office are, are, are out, and sometimes we miss the next meeting. So I think to have it more like has been written is, is a better approach. I mean, there are some personnel opportunities where when you're meeting every two weeks and your minutes are uh, fairly many multiple pages long, uh, it is sometimes difficult to get them ready for the next meeting. So I prefer to leave it as it is. On my right. John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. We have to be careful about punitive damages. We have to remember that, that every one of these boards has volunteers. And who's really going to be hurt if um, we try and talk about punitive damages for somebody not turning in their minutes in a timely manner? So we tell a volunteer, you're fired, somebody that might have been a longtime volunteer, who's going to get hurt? The town will actually get hurt because it's really tough to find people for all of these boards. You know, some people are on several boards just to keep them full and, and keep them working. So who's really going to get hurt? So we really have to be careful when we start talking about punitive damages. Thank you. On my left. Steve Frobeter, Sanctuary Lane. Mr. Moderator, I move the question. Well, I'd, I'd like to hold that for a second uh, just to double check. Uh, Ms. Wright, are you intending to propose an amendment? I'd, I'd like to give her the opportunity to propose the amendment since we asked her to do that if she wanted to before we cut off debate. Dan Terry, 9 John Matthew Road. So I get that there's no uh, uh, punitive ish concern here. Can you describe how, who will be responsible for compliance? Mr. Herr, Mr. Kamalo. The individual boards would be responsible for meeting the intent of the dates and timelines. So this is the, it's really a guideline for boards to adhere to for themselves. Okay, thank you. On my right. Mr. Moderator, and to the boards that are sitting at, at in front, this is a, it seems as though there is a conundrum here um, with regards to punitive versus whose, whose accountability is it and what time frame is appropriate. Um, to John Catino's um, rebuttal, it would be the, it would, it would seem that we are volunteer boards and to find the boards or to find an individual would go against all that we, we ask in volunteerism towards that. Um, 
again, the boards work very, very hard with the um, people that are behind the boards that do their job extremely well. There's so much to go over on minutes, maybe misspellings, maybe um, things that weren't implied, maybe things that, that didn't need to, um, that were taken out of context. So they have to be looked at and then they have to be submitted. And that takes time too. And you gotta remember that, that these, these people behind the scenes aren't just doing um, minutes. They're doing everything that is associated to that board and, and maybe more. And so we have to first set the bar and do what we're doing right now and, and make that a precedent. And then find out, as you, Mr. Moderator, said in compliance with this article is that, you know, or, or the attorney, um, that, that we, we set a substandard, uh, uh, I mean a standard that is not subpar to what we were intending, but not to overblow it or overstate it so that we we're fining people and holding people accountable at this juncture. It's something that we need to, as in any law that we, we change or bylaw that we change, we set the parameters of that and see how it works. We're not out to, to, to find people for, um, and I'm trying to take up a little bit of time. Oh, you're no. ready. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so uh, the two minute clock is thank up. Thank you. It's, it's up, but I just want you to know that, that the boards do their job and this, this looks really good on paper right now. There are some kinks that need to be worked out of it, but I think some leniency on, a, on everybody's understanding about um, the punitive aspect needs to be incorporated here. Thank, Thank you. you. On my left. Ann Matina, 40 Eastview Road. I agree with um, Mr. Catino, especially uh, Mr. it Moderator, is. Point of order, you have a motion on the floor to end debate. Why are we listening to more discussion? Because we were waiting. Well. I know, but the, the amendment's already up. I mean, point of order, please. I'm going to let Ms. Matina continue. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it is hard to get volunteers, and it is a pain to get those minutes in. There's no question about it. But rather than uh, looking at this as um, a mountain, making a mountain out of molehill, it's about transparency and accessibility. Mm -hmm. And there's so much going in on in town in terms of planning and in terms of changes to all sorts of infrastructure and everything else that any citizen who wants to stay on top of things finds it very difficult to do so i would suggest that this is not an undue burden to place this 40 days on here i don't think people should be punished I do know that we have really conscientious people on these boards that are trying to make sure they stay within the letter of the law on this. But it's not, it's not a small issue. It's a big issue. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Wright. So if you can slip the amendment up there, please. <clears throat> it's off in the corner. I don't know who's controlling it. There we go. Um, again, because almost every meeting opens with the reading and approval of minutes. Well, can I, can I just ask that you make the, that you propose the amendment that you intend no. to make? Okay, so the amendment essentially says, well, all boards, committees, and commissions of the town shall approve the minutes of their open session or executive session meetings at its next meeting. And that's common practice. Is there, is there a <clears throat> second to this amendment? Okay. Uh, we're going to switch to discussion on the amendment. So oh. it's specifically discussion on the amendment. So, Mr. Moderator, now is the time I get to elaborate a little bit? Two minutes. Okay. So the point being is that we have... This is not to penalize any committee, but when they meet, their next meeting has the first order on the agenda is approval of the minutes. So if you put the 40-day clause in there, you're actually letting them take longer than that next meeting. And this just has them going through the process at every meeting, they're approving the last meeting's minutes and then submitting them. And this is common practice for any board um, in any town. 
On my left, again, we're talking to the amendment. Uh, speaking to the amendment, Mr. <clears throat> Moderator, mm -hmm. uh, I'm in favor of this amendment. Uh, Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Uh, um, uh, I'm in favor of this amendment. Uh, as for um, the thought that, well, these are volunteers, uh, let's not push too hard. These are volunteers that stepped up to do a job. If, they're, if we're not doing the job, we need to be held accountable. Uh, we've managed to do it on all the boards I've been on. And if there are boards out there that are not getting their minutes up on time, I'm sorry, but we should hold those boards accountable. No one has introduced the idea of, someone mentioned punitive damages, one of the selectmen. No one has said anything that we're gonna <clears throat> create punitive damages, but we do wanna hold our volunteers uh, accountable. No one is entitled to respect. We earn respect by meeting the high standards expected of volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. On my right. Claire Wright, 28 <clears throat> Hayden Row Street. Um, I speak in opposition to this amendment. I have spent years working on small boards and committees. Um, there are boards that not only only meet once a month or every couple months, um, perhaps the one person that takes the minutes, and this can be a long job to get these all typed out if it's a lengthy um, meeting and there's a lot of detail. Um, the next meeting, they're sick and they can't make the meeting or they're out of town. Um, there are myriad reasons why sometimes the secretary, the note taker, isn't there. I've also, even on a large active board like the planning board, seen a night when there was an absolutely full agenda with public hearings and um, you know, the meeting going on past 10 o'clock and you just don't get time to go through and approve the minutes. Um, anybody can just look on the town website and see a lengthy list of town boards and committees that are begging for members that are not filled. Uh, the strength of this town is volunteerism. And um, I respect the general article to try to set some guidelines as Mr. Terry described it. Um, but let's not go ahead and start trying to punish um, and discourage our volunteers, particularly on some small boards where if you've served on them, you understand um, what it's like. So I strongly oppose removing this additional allowance for time for our good volunteers. On my left. Pam Waxlax, 15 Smith Road, also a member of the Appropriation Committee. I want to speak against this amendment. We meet, we have met this year, September, one day, January, one evening, and twice a week in, in the month of April and March. So twice a week is often very difficult to turn around minutes before the next meeting, which could be less than 48 hours after the previous meeting. Thank you. On my right, Sean Gibble, 64 Teresa Road. Um, I advocate, I do appreciate the 40 days. I think that's a good standard, uh, especially for the committees that don't meet frequently. I, uh, I advocate that we keep the wording as is, except for the fact I recommend we change later to earlier. Um, in light of the, the, the committees that are meeting twice a week, I do think it is a high standard to have those meetings minutes being met. However, I think that's, that's crucial because sometimes those committees are dealing with issues that need to be discussed at the next meeting and having those minutes would be crucial to that su subsequent meeting. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that was a, a, <clears throat> a subsequent amendment or... Yes. Um, I'll point out that there... Uh, well, uh, I'm going to turn it to Town Council to comment on the problem with that. <laughs> okay, so can't just change whichever is later to whichever is er earlier because uh, that, would re that would force committees that meet um, very infrequently to hold extra meetings just for the purpose of, of um, doing minutes. So the, uh, it would require every committee to meet at least once every 40 days 
it's probably not the intended the intent well if they meet annually after that annual meeting they have 40 days to submit the minutes well but they have to uh, this, meet in yeah. order to approve the minutes <clears throat> That's this the is this is the problem with trying to do these things on the fly that that aren't uh, you know that don't go through the process of, of getting vetted in advance is, is there do you want to continue to try to propose that amendment or do you want to withdraw it withdrawn thank you on my left um, Lori Nickerson 30 Glen Road and speaking in opposition to this for a couple reasons um, the way that it's drafted if you have an executive session where you need to approve executive session minutes then you have to have another executive session to approve the executive session minutes and then also decide whether or not they are within the purview of being released so you then are creating another executive session to approve the executive session, which then is just a, you're spinning around in circles. In addition, like Ms. Mrs. Waxlock stated, if you have meetings back to back, like for instance, the school committee has now had two meetings back to back for both meetings of town meeting, and we would then have had to approve last night's minutes at tonight's meeting in order to be in compliance with this, which is completely ridiculous because no one would have had the chance to draft them, read them, discuss them or even allow any time for revisions if there was something wrong with them so in order to you're, you're forcing an approval to occur at a next meeting when open meeting law requires us to have the discussion about the minutes openly and discuss the revisions and have time to then make those revisions so it completely prevents that process from happening um, so I, I think that the intent of the amendment was appropriate, but the actual operation of it doesn't work for most committees. And I, I also think that I'd like to understand where the concern is from the town on what is actually happening with the minutes all across the town, because open meeting law does protect all of the citizens of the state in this regard already. I think the bylaws are trying to set a standard for all boards, being that all boards are different sizes and different meeting cadence, but at the same time, we're already protected under this open meeting law, and there is punitive um, situations there where boards in this state have been fined and individuals have been fined. So if you're looking for that, perspective it exists you can actually read the news and read about boards that have had these fines brought against them on my right Mike Manning 32 Briarcliff Drive um, as chairman of the Appropriations Committee I, I guess I'm reiterating what everyone else just said but our committee does meet consecutive nights sometimes Wednesday and Thursday and it's this is just not reasonable to have minutes by the next day so I'm just reiterating thank you on my left Helen Scordino for David Joseph Road. I'd like to call the question on the motion for the amendment. Is there a second? second? Okay, all those in favor of ending debate on the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Clearly two thirds, okay. So now we're ready for a vote on the amendment language only, not on the main motion. Everyone understand that? All those in favor of the amendment as shown on the screen. Signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, and clearly fails. Okay. Uh, we're back to the, to the main motion. Is there any further discussion on the main motion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote on the main motion. All those in favor of Article uh, 41 as presented in the warrants article? Signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. And it's clearly um, majority. Connor, we're set as far as 100. Okay. Article 42, departmental revolving funds. Mr. Kamalo or Mr. Herr? Mr. Moderator, we move Article 42 as written in the motions document. Mr. Kamalo will explain. Okay, Mr. Kamalo. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Moderator, uh, this proposal takes advantage of the municipal modernization law. Uh, it provides more flexibility by eliminating the departmental fund and total fund caps 
uh, broadening the types of departmental receipts for which funds can be established and providing for the revolving funds to be established by, by law, uh, in this case, instead of an annual legislative body vote. By way of illustration, recall yesterday those of us who were present, we approved revolving funds under Article 8. That's what the old law provided. The new law provides for what we're asking for under this proposal, i.e. the revolving funds will be established through by law. Which should be clear to everyone, correct? Are there questions? Seeing that there are no questions, all those in favor of Article 42 as presented, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it passes unanimously. Article 43, posting of warrant. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Mr. Sestari. We move the article as written. Any explanation? Article 43 changes the locations where town meeting warrants need to be posted. The changes are changing town house to being town hall. Uh, requirement for posting in each of the churches in town is removed. The required posting in the public library and senior center are added, and a required posting in each of the engine houses of the town is changed to at least one public safety building. These changes ensure that all posting <coughs> locations are open to the public and are handicapped accessible. Are there questions? Uh, I do have one. What happens when town hall is inaccessible? <laughs> Only kidding. <coughs> Seeing no questions, uh, all those in favor of Article 43 as presented signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 44, town meeting quorum. This has been uh, through citizens' pe petition, and I'll ask Pam Wexlax to uh, speak to the motion. Pam Wexlax, 15 Smith Road. Somebody very tall before. <laughs> I move the article as I move the motion as written in the warrant articles and motions document. And Josh, if you could put the slide up on the screen. <clears throat> Hopefully. The slide behind me shows the current bylaw with the amendments I'm proposing this evening. According to town bylaws, a quorum of 100 residents is needed at town meetings only for financial articles. Many residents believe this is a requirement for all articles in town meeting, but that is not the case. As long as one resident is present, unlikely as that would be, a non-financial article may be voted. In researching the background on quorums, I noted that both the Secretary of the Commonwealth and the Massachusetts General Laws state that individual towns may set the quorum threshold. Further, our town bylaws dating back to 1873 have only called for a quorum on financial articles. The quorum was changed from 50 to 100 residents, again just for financial matters, in 1996. My proposal will create a threshold of 75 residents for the passage of any article at town meeting. The reduction is not that 100 was too high, but rather that there was previously no quorum for non-financial articles, and as the nights of town meeting proceed and the residents present dwindle, it allows for business to still be transacted. Are there questions? On my right. Um, I have an amendment for this article that Josh already has. Okay. I need two different glasses to be able to read that. <laughs> so to amend 47 dash, oh, Darlene Hayes, third road, sorry. I move that the language of section seven, section 4713 of the general bylaws as proposed under article 44 of the annual town meeting will be amended by striking the term 75 voters of town therefrom and inserting in place thereof the words, a number of voters equal to 1% of the number of registered voters of the town as of December 31st of the most recent year ending in a two or seven as determined by town clerk. So the section would read as follows. The presence of the number of voters equals 1% of the number of registered voters of the town as of December of the most recent year ending in a two or seven. 
um, determined by the town clerk shall be required to constitute a quorum for transaction of any business at any town meeting. Um, the two of the seven meant that we had discussed doing this every five years. And my theory was that, you know, I don't want to see our quorum number ever go backwards when in 1990 we had 5,195 voters, registered voters. In 2000 we had 7,590. And as of today we have 11,692 voters. So to have 1% as the um, quorum requirement would be 116 people here tonight and we have more than that and we had well more than that last night. Um, before we get to that, I, I made a uh, technical mistake. We need to accept the citizen's petition <coughs> in front of us. Yes, second. So it needs to be a second. 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 Okay. okay, all right. Um, so, yeah, is there a second to this uh, proposed amendment to the citizen's petition? Second. second. Discussion on the amendment. On my left. Alton Chen, Three Nichols Road. Do we have perspective or history as to how many attendees have been at town meeting over the last five to 10 years? Because although we're at close to 11 or 11,000 registered voters today, uh, <clears throat> the last several years have consistently fit in the same room. So I would say there's probably still only 100 to 200 people still attending regularly. Mm -hmm. And so then my reason for trend lines is do we risk being able to move forward with articles if we move to this fixed rate of 1%? Well, I'll speak um, from moderator's position. It, it would be, from a personal perspective, it would be very discouraging if uh, in imposing an even higher quorum requirement caused us to have to adjourn town meeting for lack of a quorum and then have to reconvene the following night trying to get you know, the requisite number of people in, into, uh, into an, uh, an adjourned meeting. Again, um, and I'm speaking to that from just from the practicality of wanting to conduct the business uh, in, a, in a fashion that enables us to continue um, during consecutive evenings and get our business done. But okay. on my right, Todd Sestari, 19 Elizabeth Road. Um, I appreciate the citizen's petition and what it's trying to achieve in patching the hole of not having a quorum at all for non-financial articles. And I do think that there should be a quorum for those non-financial articles. Uh, however, I don't feel comfortable with backing the number up and lowering the bar, if you will, for the financial articles as well as the non-financials. I think they should both be the same, should be a standard, whether it stays at 100, or whether it goes to some moving bar like this, uh, it seems to make more sense to me than, than backing the number up. Yeah, yes. On the left, on my left, again to the amendment. Leah butler Rafferty at <clears throat> Five Meadowlands. And um, I think this is actually perfectly reasonable. I think if we're not getting 1% in a town meeting, and I've been here about a year and a half, I had to struggle to really find online the date of the town meeting. I uh, luckily am part of the Democratic Committee and Darlene gave it to me, but it was really hard to find it on the town calendar on the website. So if we are not doing a good enough job of PR <laughs> to let people know when to show up, I, I, uh, we sh we, I guess we shouldn't lower the bar, we should be raising our own bar as to how to get citizens into the town meeting. Right, so I think the one percent is a perfectly reasonable number. Thank you. On my right, John Palmer, 87 Main Street. I second the, those comments. The last two comments. Um, I like this. I li I, li I I like the hundred, but I do not like going down less than that for the reason that we're act enacting business for the town, and we have there's such a few few people doing it. I'm not sure we're going to get the right answer. The, um, 
and, and I'm concerned with backing it down to 75. So I, I like this amendment as a, um, as a position of getting at least the 100, 116 people here to do that. On my left. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Uh, the previous three speakers actually covered all the points I wanted to say, but we, we do have to do a better job of, of getting people to town meeting, alerting them about it. Uh, maybe people that don't feel comfortable coming into meetings, we should maybe find ways to explain how town meeting works. Um, but uh, to, to the amendment. I think to the amendment, uh, I support this amendment, and uh, I do agree that something needs to be done in the bylaws, to, as Pam's pointing out, to make it more in line with what our expectations are. And otherwise, we're looking at <coughs> representative town meeting uh, as an option if we don't get enough people to come to our meetings. Thank On my you. right. Brendan and Ted Stone, Pleasant Street. Um, I like the amendment that Ms. Waxlax put up. Uh, I find when we put in uh, percentages with years ending in two and seven, math is not always an easy thing for a lot of people. So, uh, but one of the things with the quorum that has, is kind of annoying to me is, I'll use last year's town meeting as an example. <clears throat> we had a dog park in front of us where the place was pretty full. We definitely had a good quorum. As soon as that dog park was finished, there was a mass exodus out the door. So their agenda for the dog park was taken care of. The next article was changing, lessening the distance that a sexual predator could live to a school. And it annoys me that people found it more important. Well, we're, we're wandering from the discussion of quorum here. All right, so I'm in favor of the article. In, in favor of the, the amendment or in favor of the article or? I'm in favor of the amendment. Thank you. On my right again. Hi, Kelly Carp, 23 Nicholas Road. Um, speaking in favor of the amendment, um, I don't think that we should ever lower the quorum um, number uh, to accommodate the, uh, I guess, the lack of attendance. And I do agree that uh, it is very difficult, I think, for us to find information about town meeting. And I would like to suggest that perhaps we do uh, mailers or uh, reverse 911 or uh, take out ads in the independent so that our, our citizens are more aware of town meeting. Thank you. On my left. I agree with not lowering the bar on the quorum amount of um, participants. Um, I also am an advocate of what was just stated was that well, let's, oh, Clifford let's, Kistner, 86 North Main yeah, Street. Let's fo right, focus you. on the amendment. Yes, so, so I, I, I don't go along with this one um, to, the, to the nth of it being that we do the 1%, but I also don't go along with the other one stating that we bring the bar down to 75. I think it should stay at 100. That's what has worked, and if we have issues with that, then um, backwards is not always the, direct, the right direction to go in. On my right. Dick Dugan, 38 Priscilla Road. The, if, if, we, if we can't get 1% of our legislature here, and that's the number of registered voters, if we can't get 1% of our legislators here, it seems to me we should not be doing business for the other 99%. We should not be passing things. We should find, we should find out what we're doing wrong to, in not getting them here. And by the way, the, the currently, I would, I would say just off the top of my head, I'm not good at math either, but something, our current quorum for our legislature is something around nine-tenths of 1%, and the original thing said move it down to seven-tenths of 1% or something less than that. And the equivalent in the U.S. Congress would be one senator and two out of three reps could pass a law, any kind of a law. I think that shows the absurdity of, of, of lowering this even further than it is. Thank you. On my left. Dave Paul, 7 Meadowland Drive. Um, I want to speak against this amendment and support the article as it's written by Ms. Wextax. Um, I believe that the recruiting of people for the town meeting should be a separate function than providing a quorum. I think if you go too high with 100, 116, you're actually punishing the people that will show up here that got babysitters, that took time out of their day, most of them volunteers, to show up for the town meeting. So I, I would like to support the main article. 
Am I right? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mary Jo Underkin, 2 College Street. I rise in support of the amendment. We need to encourage citizen participation. We need to do a better job. Uh, I strongly support this amendment. Thank you. John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. I think it's very important that we have as many people as possible to come to town meeting and, and to vote. It's, that's, that should be uh, uh, what everybody should want to do to be a good citizen and neighbor. But one of the things I would like to, if do you, Mr. Moderator, to uh, town council, if this, if either one of these amendments, uh, these warrants pass, is the uh, articles pass, um, and to um, Mr. Ted Stone's comment, if somebody come, if, if we have 200 people for one question and then 170 leave and there are 35 people, do we have to end town meeting or can we continue without a quorum? If if someone questions whether a quorum exists and we determine that a quorum no longer exists, we cannot continue to conduct uh, any business. So that would be my only concern if we set the bar too high, even though it's great to have a lot of people here, but for every, because we usually finish the, the money ones first, and that would be my only concern if, if we end up having an end town meeting and wait till the next day, we could be, have a, a week of town meetings and uh, nobody likes that. Hi, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, just to clarify what Mrs. Wax and myself were saying, that um, this would be for all articles, not just financial articles. Regardless of which one you guys select, <clears throat> we mean that we want a, a quorum at all the articles. Um, in regards to the 1%, that was a number based on the fact of our increased amount of um, registered voters to go up the amount we have, which is literally like, we more than doubled in the last 17 years in registered voters. Um, I have not been at a town meeting start at any night, and I rarely ever meet one, that we haven't met what this 1% quorum would be. And I actually was talking to Norm earlier. Last night I was able to count at least 12 new people who had never been to town meeting before. So I think it's just trying to regenerate and get people to come. But 1% is not a big number with we keep saying we're a growing town and population. We have 17,000 people now in town to get 1% of the registered voters. We had well over that last night. Claire Wright, 20 in Hayden Row. Um, I am opposed to the amendment and I'm opposed to the article. Um, I don't want to see anything that drops the number lower than 100. But in terms of the 1%, um, I know we're a growing community. I would love to see more people. But um, from a practical standpoint, as Mr. Moderator alluded, the, the specter of a meeting, it, it, it takes quite a bit to get one of these meetings together. There are costs involved. There are time commitments. The thought that we would get here, and um, we had to we had to cancel town meeting because we couldn't get those numbers. Um, I, I think that's a really frightening thing to contemplate. So I would like to keep it at 100. I don't want to make town meeting any weaker, but um, I, I am opposed to both the amendment and the article. Kelly Carp, 23 Nicholas Road. Uh, I just wanted clarification on uh, what Mr. Catino said. Uh, he did ask the question that um, if we fell below the number would we have to discontinue the meeting because we didn't have quorum? And I believe you said uh, if anybody questioned that, we would have to stop. Is that correct? Yes. So, but that could happen now, and that could happen with any number that we had. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. It, it would be true only with respect to financial issues. In other words, if if we fell below 100 today and we were discussing there were financial matters to be discussed, then uh, the meeting would have to be adjourned. If it were non-financial today, the meeting could continue with one person in the audience. Leslie Ficari, 57 Greenwood Road. I stand in support of this article. Um, the, of the, the article or the amendment? The amendment. Um, because I think it's really important that we are pushing the number of people coming to town meeting. I think earlier we said in 1873 we needed 50 people for a quorum. That probably did not include women coming to town meeting. And the percentage of people that would have to come to town meeting to govern was probably pretty high at 50 in 1873. They, didn't have, they didn't have television. 
and yeah. we're and we're asking for 116 people to come. <clears throat> just perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Dick Dugan, 38 Priscilla Road. Um, one comment first. People watching on television can't vote, so they're not really here. <laughs> they don't count. Um, I like to respond through the moderator to Mrs. Wright's comments. I, I think actually they were the best argument I've ever heard against this form of government altogether because people can't get here. But that's not where we're going with this. We're just trying to make sure that we have a, a reasonable or close to reasonable number of people to, to pass on the legislation that comes before this legislature. Thank you. Kevin Shea, 11 Lowell, move the question. Is there a second to end debate? All those in favor of ending debate on the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we're ready for <clears throat> a vote on the amendment. So simply the amendment. And then after we take the vote on the amendment, we'll go back to discussion on the main motion. <clears throat> the amendment uh, would establish a 1% a, a of registered voters threshold. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. no. Uh, let's get some exercise. All those in favor of the amendment, please rise. Seven, including the camera uh, operator in front of me. No, I've got it. Center front, Mr. Moderator, um, 22. 22, center front. Center rear, 18. 18. Moderators left, 26. 26 on the left. Right, 35. 35. And all those opposed, rise and hold your cards. Eight on the stage. Center front, seven. Right, five. Five on the right. Five, center rear. Five, center rear. Sixteen on your left. 16 on the left, 15, 20, 25, 41, 108, 41 passes. Okay, so the amendment passes. So now we're back to a discussion of the motion which has been amended as you see on the, on the screen. Is there any further discussion relating to the, the motion as amended? Okay, hearing none, seeing none. All those in favor of Article 44, as it, as it has been amended, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. And it's a clear majority. Thank you. Article 45, alcohol sales at town facilities. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 45 as set forth in the motions document. 
and an explanation. If we could put the explanation up on the screen, please. And I'll read it to you as well. The changes proposed in this article would allow the Board of Selectmen to authorize up to three events per year during which alcohol could be served, possessed, sold, and cons or consumed in a public building or on public land, with the exception of on public ways, school department property, or public buildings or lands within 500 feet of a school. In order to qualify for the one-day license, the event must be hosted by a nonprofit organization. The proceeds must be used in a manner that directly benefits the town or its residents. The event marks a special occasion, and consumption does not occur outside the hours of 10 a.m. and 1 a.m. In approving the special license, the board may impose other conditions at its discretion. We have uh, a new library opening up in the next year or two. We have a new DPW facility opening up in the next year or two. And there are other types of events that have happened in Hopkinton in the past that will happen in the future. This gives us a little bit of flexibility to have a nice event, uh, an event where folks can enjoy themselves, obviously behave responsibly, uh, and it gives the Board of Selectmen the opportunity to look at a one-day license for such type of events. That's what the article is designed to do, and I think it's pretty clear where we can do these things and where we cannot. Are there questions? Hi there, Mark Stephan, 18 Granite. Uh, just a clarification on the term special occasion. Would that include annual events? We can only do three events per year. Uh, with this bylaw change. Uh, so uh, I think annual events might get a little tight, frankly, if other things are going on in town. Uh, but with three as the limit, uh, it, would, it would be a consideration, I guess. Sure. Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. The 500 feet, how does that relate to, like, the CAA building, which is, a, I believe, a town building that we've leased to somebody else. The question is for Mr. Herr. Thank you. Uh, excellent question. The HCA has a special lease agreement with the town of Hopkinton specific to what it can do at its facility. That includes uh, what it can serve and when it can serve it and who can serve uh, alcohol and other items. I, I do have a question. It, it, as written, this does not allow the town to be a host. Is that, uh, can you elaborate on that at all? Is my understanding correct in the first place? Yeah, it would be nonprofit organizations as it's spelled out in the uh, article or in, uh, in the explanation anyway. Um, so we're looking for organizations like the Friends of the Library, uh, organizations that support different uh, entities in town. So it's more nonprofits than the town itself. Thank you. Any other questions? On my right? Sandy Altamira, Elm Street. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't understand this article. You're limiting yourself to three events a year. How many can you do now, and why are you limiting yourself? None now. We can't, oh, we can't do any? We can't do any now. We can't have alcohol at a new DPW facility as we have it, have our bylaws in place today. Why are you limiting yourself? Through me? I'm sorry, of course, <laughs> through you. <laughs> Mr. Herr. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not designed to be a regular um, party scene, if you will. Um, we we, we want to have... Unlike town meeting. Unlike town meeting. Uh, this would be a good place, perhaps, for alcohol sales. Um, Couldn't we, uh, That'll increase probably attendance. probably get a better crowd. <laughs> that, that, that's right. That handles the last article. So it's really designed for special occasions, and it really came before us as we talked about the new library, the new DBW facility, and a couple other things going on in town. That's what set it kind of in motion, and it seemed to be reasonable with three a year that it wouldn't turn into a big party carnival situation. 
Well, you know, if this is what you want, I really don't have any problem with it. But like you said, um, through you, Mr. Moderator, there's, um, you, you've already mentioned three or four. Some years there might be more. Some I, I just don't see the limit, I guess. But I don't care. If that's what you want. It's fine. <laughs> On my left. Kathleen Culler, Legislative mm -hmm. Drive. Um, I question uh, the, also the limit of just three. Um, I sit, I have volunteered for bunches of groups in this town who could benefit from uh, being allowed to participate in this. So I wonder, are, uh, are you pitting volunteer groups against each other, vying for the opportunity to get uh, this opportunity? Mr. Hearn? I think the, the question about three and the limit of three is a, is a, is a valid one. Um, you know, we were trying to do it in a way that we were, we were trying to be as conservative as possible in putting this forth before town meeting. Uh, I suspect that if a town meeting is interested in having a couple more parties, that the, the board would likely support an amendment to that, to that end. On my right. Kevin Shea, 11 Lowell Drive. Mr. Moderator, could we get a legal clarification about the liability that the town would have even if the nonprofit had its own insurance? Um, would not the town be ultimately liable to any uh, incident? Can I do we want counsel to answer, or are there requirements that the Board of Selectmen would impose upon the organization to maintain some liability insurance in favor of the town for such an event? Go ahead. Okay. So there would continue to be the requirement for events of this type that they get a one day, so-called one day um, alcohol permit uh, from the Board of Selectmen. It is the Board's routine practice to require insurance for those uh, um, uh, licenses. In the event that we have, um, um, in the event that, that we allow uh, entities to use town properties today, we always require them to um, not only to have insurance, but to name the town as an additional insured. Uh, in addition, part of the licensing proce process requires tips so-called TIPS training, which is the uh, uh, safety training for the, for the servers. So um, um, there is no such thing as premises liability for the town. That, that is to say, um, the town's um, uh, liability is limited by the Tort Claims Act only to actual negligence. So the mere fact that, that this occurred on town property would not be enough to impose uh, additional liability on the town. On my left. Uh, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, we looked at this uh, back in the day when the Senior Center was opening. Um, and we ultimately decided no because it was setting a precedent. Um, I do have concerns. Um, I wanted to come up here and joke and think that margaritas would be great at town meeting, but um, I think that we can have celebrations without alcohol and set a great example for everybody and our kids. Um, I wonder if, for example, um, the DPW even counts. There's no friends of the DPW. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the whole town loves DPW. No <laughs> well, okay, right. I, you know, no formal friends. We're all friends of the DPW. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how far the library is from the park that is the common or the school that is center school. Um, I, I, I'm inclined to, to say that we can celebrate with a lot of enthusiasm and festivity, openings of new buildings without necessarily having alcohol. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I don't 
think North Street's going to get plowed anymore, but um, <laughs> on the side note, I'm actually a certified event planner, and um, my Ballywick is actually a lot of nonprofit events. And if it, if this is limited to three, I'll, I'll be honest, you'll take the businesses out of t you'll people will plan their events outside of Hopkinton. So whether you want the revenue here, or do you want the revenue going other places? But I mean, I've pulled hundreds of one-day permits um, across. New England Mid Atlantic, with no issue from liability to tips, trains to that, but to limit it to three, you are what someone had said, rallying one nonprofit against another, and those nonprofits will then just take their business to other towns that are neighboring and give the revenue there. On my left, Anne Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, I agree with what Darlene just said, and also what Kathleen said. Um, it's really it. People already go outside of town. I mean, there isn't any place really that you can do something like this unless you go to a restaurant. Um, and my question was, how much drinking are they going to do at the DPW? We, we might need to look into this a little bit, Brian. Um, and, and does this include the senior center? You mentioned the new library and the um, uh, DPW building. Is, the senior center included or no? Town Hall? Mr. Herr? Yes, the senior center would be included. And the town hall? If once it gets repaired? <laughs> once it's dried out. Okay. All right. Pardon the pun, yes, it would get <laughs> 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 That was really bad. That was really bad. I'd like to propose an amendment if I can you want me to go up in the back. I'd like to propose an amendment to move it to six. You did it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Never mind. Um, I'm going to continue on the left. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Kathleen Culler, Ledgestone Drive. Um, I would like to propose an amendment to the article, which okay. is right here by magic. On behalf of many different volunteer groups in town, uh, I would suggest that you just take out the words as indicated on the screen. Is there a second to that amendment? Okay, so yeah, yeah, if you're going to take out the number, then you have to take out the per year as well. Oh, okay. So just so say to well, keep events in, <laughs> authorize events during which you have to take out the R as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's an amendment on the floor to um, change this article to allow an unspecified number of events. So we'll now um, entertain discussion relating to the amendment. Do, or do you have some rationale that you well, want to propose? Uh, my, my, I, I would not like to see all the myriad volunteer groups in town having to, being pitted against each other to get one of three possible opportunities. And I don't think the selectmen would want to be in a position where they would favor one volunteer group or another over another. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment on my right. Um, Amy Groves to College Street. I'm not sure. My question may pertain to the amendment or the article. Um, perhaps I'll try it out and see if it's permissible. Okay. <laughs> um, in both cases, I'm wondering um, what are the criteria that the um, I, I'm in favor, but what are the criteria that the um, selectmen will use in determining the relative merits um, of these applications? Where is that laid out, and will it be laid out? Mr. Herr, can you address that? I'm sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> uh, through the moderator, <laughs> um, what are the criteria that the uh, Board of Selectmen will be using to, to weigh the merits of the applications, and will that be laid out so that we can submit an application with some feeling of we might have some success? So, so the Board of Selectmen today, and for years in the past, has had a one-day liquor license tool in, in the bucket, if you will. And we use that uh, when asked. 
uh, but we don't take the responsibility lightly. So I don't anticipate a huge influx of requests because we've always had this and there's been nonprofit organizations in town for a long time. They would have to find a different venue until this evening perhaps, but uh, still one day liquor license have to be issued even for non-public buildings. So I don't think there's gonna be a huge influx of additional requests and we'll continue to take the same uh, level of uh, uh, scrutiny or put the same level of scrutiny on an application uh, going forward should this pass tonight. And Mr. Moderator, with your permission, may I ask a follow-on question? Yes. Particularly with regards to the amendment, um, have the, um, has the Hopkinton police been requested for input on this? Have they weighed in? Are they in favor? Mr. Herr. Mr. Kamalo, or Chief, are you here? I believe the chief has been involved in the uh, proposed article before us tonight, but obviously the amendment is new. He's coming. As he makes his way, Mr. Moderator, can I speak in favor of the amendment? Go ahead. Is that okay? I'm okay uh, as one individual, uh, as a resident, with the amendment as proposed. I would expect the Board of Selectmen will continue to be very uh, careful and cautious as they issue these one-day licenses. But if town meeting is interested in opening up to a few more activities a year, I would support that. Thank you. Chief? Uh, as with any event that has alcohol, uh, input is always uh, sought from the police department. Myself and my team always look at uh, making sure there's proper security at events, who's going to be serving alcohol, ensuring alcohol doesn't go off the premises. We do a, uh, a pretty good job working with the town to make sure that uh, it is certainly vetted. And uh, if we don't get those insurances, uh, the board has always been good with backing us and uh, denying. Thank you. Uh, John Cotero, 1 David Joseph Road. Uh, this is great. You know, this came up at the, with the Board of Selectmen because when we were talking about the opening of the library, and for like the friends of the library, if they wanted to have champagne or something at the opening, the way the, the uh, bylaws are written right now, they couldn't have champagne or something at the opening. And so all it was was so that we could actually have a party where there was something like champagne or wine involved at just one of these openings. But uh, seeing that there are many more people, I, I, I say stand in favor of the amendment also. So I did, we, we were just trying to stay very conservative. We didn't know how this was going to go over at town meeting. But, uh, wow, good. On my left. Hi, Tara Sanda for Equestrian Drive. As somebody who just went through a month and a half of getting a one-day liquor license, I can guarantee the town that the Board of Selectmen, the fire chief, the chief lead, do not take this lightly. I basically had to sign away my firstborn in order to get a one-day liquor license for an event for the Hoppington PTA. Um, and I, I think we're missing the spirit of this article and it's to celebrate the volunteers in this town. We just spent the last article talking about volunteers and how hard it is to get them. This is trying to celebrate all of us that spend all of our time volunteering and bringing our kids to town meeting. So I completely support both articles. On my right. Yes, Mr. Moderator, Clifford <clears throat> Kistner, 86 West Main Street. Um, I make a motion to amend the amendment. And the, the way that I see fit is to um, Muriel's proclamation about being able to do alcohol at events when children are maybe present or maybe not present, um, you know, when we talk about celebratory aspects of champagne can and I, wine. Can I ask you to place the amendment before us? The, the amendment would be alcoholic, uh, alcoholic beverages changed to beer and wine. And that being the limit of this, this amendment. Uh, as an aside, is there and champagne would fall under the, the wine well, aspect. As an aside to, to Mr. Herr or Mr. Kamalo, do you, is that something that you limit in any case? In, in other words, in your deliberations, do you historically, you have always limited to beer and wine? 
not necessarily limiting it to beer and wine, but there is an extensive discussion as to what beer is sold or what alcohol is sold or distributed at the event. And in fact, if I may, through the town moderator, the individuals who came before our office are to request this motion and to support the Atlee Town Meeting uh, expected or advised us to um, focus the uh, proposal on alcoholic beverages. There was a discussion in terms of limiting it to beer and wine. The feeling was that if you limit it to beer and wine, you limit the ability for fundraising. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the goal again is to allow nonprofits in town to celebrate the opening of town facilities and most importantly, for those nonprofits that do fundraising to at least mark the opening of a facility via or through a gala event. And the feeling was that if you limit it to a beer and wine only, you limit the ability for the fundraising. To that point, Mr. Moderator, that being said, the, the present bylaw that we have has no, there are no bylaw that says that we can have alcohol at, at, at present. I think stepping forward, alcohol in, in, its, in itself is, is a mood changer in a lot of ways. And we've seen people abuse it. The, the police. What I'd like to see before we, you know, before we address the point of order is a specific amendment. The, the, the specific amendment again is alcoholic beverages be taken out, taken out, and beer and wine only put in. And but the the, the wine aspect would would champagne would fall under the wine. Okay. The, the, Hold on a second. We're trying to piece specific language together that gets at, uh, at this intent so that people can see it on the screen. Mr. Moderator, with, uh, if I may elaborate on why I choose to... No, let's, let's wait until we can see it on the screen. Mr. Moderator? Who's... I was first. <laughs> <laughs> We're dealing with an amendment to an amendment. <laughs> But shouldn't you, point of order, sir? Yes. Why are we not dealing with the amendment? Because there's been a subsequent uh, proposal for an amendment. Okay. <clears throat> if it passes or doesn't pass, then it comes back to 
your amendment if yours passes or doesn't pass it goes back to the main motion okay. so when do I get to speak about the second change I will I'll let okay. you know thank you but then we have to <clears throat> make the other change down here. Yeah. Uh, again, I, you know, I don't want to, uh, maybe I do want this to serve as an admonition, but when we get these amendments that are done on the fly, um, it becomes difficult because we, we now have to create language. We have to be sure that that language isn't in conflict with other language in the bylaws. Um, and honestly, it would be better for town meeting and for all of us <clears throat> if these could be run through uh, the public hearing process brought to the town manager in advance so that the specific language can be vetted and we don't uh, waste time here trying to do drafting. So sometimes this is what did you mean? Okay. And then what if we just said by amending? By, by amending. Section 58-1A as follows. As follows. Okay. Accepted. And all right. And then you want to you want to put the beer and wine in in bold, including okay. beer and wine. You don't need that yeah. comment. Mr. Moderator. Okay. Yes. I have, a, I have a problem with the wordage that is being put up there at, at this moment. You know, hold on one second. I think we're almost there. We're almost, we're almost there. there. We're almost there. We need another minute or two. Okay. I think we're good. Did he cross that out? No, we need to define beer and wine because it's a different term under okay. the liquor law. So that's why including it. That's why right. do, you, do you want to speak to this? Just to okay. I'm going to ask town council to uh, speak to the uh, um, our interpretation of the amendment that has been proposed. Okay. So um, under the state alcohol law, uh, laws, there are. So the term alcoholic beverage is defined. Um, we need to make sure if we're going to introduce the term beer and wine that we're also um, making sure that that's going to be defined in the same way as the, as the state law requires. So um, up in the, in the original prohibition, which pro prohibits alcoholic beverage, including beer, we added including beer and wine, and then in the notwithstanding part in C, we, uh, we replaced alcoholic beverages with beer and wine. Uh, so it will all be consistent if the voters choose to limit this just to beer and wine. So the first, the first phrase, including beer and wine, is a necessary definition. And then um, what would be allowed would simply be beer and wine, That's having correct. been earlier defined. That's correct. All right. Is that 
that, have that, we captured your understanding of what you're proposing? Yes, Mr. Montgomery. Okay. Now, is there a second to that motion? Now we'll have discussion on <clears throat> the amendment which uh, Mr. Which, which Clifford has proposed, which is to uh, limit alcohol to beer and wine in the confines of this of this uh, article. Is there discussion specifically on the limitation to beer and wine? Yeah. Yes. So, can I follow up with my with with the reasoning for my motion? Go ahead. Thank you. So, we we, we look at um, Gillette Stadium, for instance. And we say they, they're not able to monetize their beer and wine sales by, by the amount of, of beer and wine that they sell. Or are we, are we talking about, well, alcohol in itself in general, um, whiskey, scotch, rum, vodka, gin, those, those products are far, far more um, aggravating than beer and wine. Uh, under moderation, in moderation, um, and and so so they're not they don't sell it at at sporting facilities and stuff like that because they know what can happen as a result of overserving and and yes we put we put things in place for for safety purpose behind that um, as it as it was mentioned in in tips certified um, and and insurances and all this other stuff but. I still think that we're going away from the, the concept of having a function and trying to put more alcohol involved into that, into that function. I just don't, I don't, I don't see the purpose of that. Beer and wine is, is the, is the, is the, has been the simple form of, 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 of um, beverage across the board for a very, very long time and it's worked. I mean, we're, we're talking about 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., I mean 1 a.m. In the morning. That's 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 the reason for me wanting it to be beer and wine only. Okay, thank you. Is there further discussion um, on the amendment? Yeah, um, I wanted to just in, in favor or not in favor. I am not in favor of limiting this to just beer and wine. Okay. Kathleen Color, 17 Ledgestone Drive. My reason is that um, what I was proposing earlier was an, uh, a vehicle by which all the different volunteer groups in town could make a little extra money at an event. Uh, and that's, I don't see that the limitation is going to, is going to get them there. At, at the same time, having worked with many groups in town, I know that they're, they're not, none of them would be proposing a wild free-for-all. It would be a limited time, probably, with a few drinks for, uh, for people who didn't like beer or wine. Thank you. On my right. May I speak to the article as opposed to the amendment? No, we're speaking to the amendment at this point. Okay, I'm a, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. <clears throat> I'm opposed to limiting it. Um, we've been extremely responsible in this town when one day permits have been pulled. Um, an example of how successful some of these events have been is the library has a used book sale. They, were, they, they le glean $3,000. Hoptoberfest and um, Pink Night glean about 60000 combined. And we want a great library, and that's been really built by a lot of private funds. Bay Path does a 5K, raises about twenty grand. has a gala, which they had to have outside of Hopkinton, raises over forty grand. These are ways of generating revenue for these nonprofits, limiting them, and limiting some of their creativeness I mean, there is always a detail. There's always the, I, I just don't see it. Thank you. On my left. Uh, John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. This might come as a surprise to some people, but I'm opposed to the Second Amendment. <laughs> um, which, which Second Amendment? Federal? Right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, seriously. <laughs> the, um, you, know, uh, you know, for all the uh, issues, the, all the uh, reasons that were mentioned previously, it really does help in, in the fundraising to have multiple. But even when we talk about dietary, there are some people that actually give up beer for Lent, that, uh, you know, and, and you know, beer is you know, the high calories and everything uh -huh. else. It's, um, you know, I, it's, I really believe that we should, uh, 
uh, not limited to beer and wine, and uh, and and. Uh, raise the number that's uh, that's allowed. We were, we were trying to be very conservative, as I, as I said before, and this is great that it's going over very well. Sandy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm against limiting it. I understand the beer and wine um, idea of it, but if somebody wanted to do a different kind of fundraiser, say say a breakfast with uh, mimosas and um, <clears throat> Bloody Marys, then they couldn't do it. So I, I, I don't think that this is a good idea. I don't think we should limit it. On my left. Brian Carp, 23 Nicholas Road. Mr. Moderator, we've had a pro, we've had some cons. Can we move the, the amendment to the amendment? Yes. Is there a second to close debate on the, okay, on the second amendment? <laughs> we'll take a vote. Uh, we'll take a vote on closing. The, all those in favor of closing debate on the second amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? So now it's a vote on the Second Amendment, which, which is to <clears throat> uh, limit the definition of alcohol for this purpose to beer and wine. All those in favor of including language that would serve to limit the alcohol to beer and wine under, under this article indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? No. And it's defeated. Now we're back to the First Amendment, which is to um, basically to allow for an unlimited number of events under the, under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen. Is there any further discussion on the First Amendment? Okay, seeing none, we're ready to vote on the First Amendment, which would change the motion, uh, the article, to allow for an unlimited number of events. All those in favor of incorporating an amendment that would allow for <clears throat> an unlimited number of events signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? No. And it's clearly passed. Now we're back to the amendment, now we're back to the original motion as amended to incorporate the um, language which is now to allow for an unlimited number of, of these such events, again under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen. Any further discussion? So I'd like to speak to the article, if that's appropriate at this time. Yes, name and address. Sue Curry's Forest Lane. Um, I am opposed <coughs> to the, um, the amendment. Um, I'm sorry, I'm opposed to the article. Um, and I speak mostly to the library. I'm not as familiar with the other town buildings. Um, so one of my understandings right now is that our library has um, somewhat limited hours and that I believe it is the hope of this town that we could increase these hours so that students can study at the library, adults can be at the library to okay. do their work after working hours. Okay, but we're, we're, this is an article that would allow a nonprofit organization to conduct an event at a town building correct under these conditions so correct. let's speak to to that specifically it's got nothing to do with library hours there Actually, may not be an event that affects the library there may be mr moderator may i yes um, i believe this does affect the library and it affects library hours most celebrations for fundraising typically <clears throat> occur either you know breakfast type celebrations particularly those with alcohol occur say 7 p.m. and they go into the evening my belief is that if we can extend library hours then we should extend those library hours for the townspeople for the students and the library patrons first I am all in favor of celebrating the groundbreaking of the library and I hope that we could get to that in some other way than to provide such general um, guidelines that really conflict both with our concerns about you know, children and, and alcohol. Um, and I think we've spent a lot of time and money investing in a library. And I think for the first mm -hmm. year that it's open, we should operate it as a library. We should work out the kinks 
understand better how it functions and what its needs are, and then perhaps entertain celebrations in the library a year from now. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Phil Totino, 17 Wayland Road. I'm opposed to this article. Uh, I think the selectmen should be ashamed of themselves for bringing forth something that would allow alcohol to be served in a library where children are going to be present. And I certainly hope that the previous speaker, Mrs. Kramer, and I are not the only ones in this hall who see the folly in this article. I think it's disgusting. On my left, Mr. Herr. I've lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> um, this is town meeting. Yeah, so I don't recall where in the article or where in any deliberation that the Board of Selectmen have had in the last 10 years that I've served where we asked if children were going to be present and we issued a one-day liquor license. We asked that question constantly and we pressed for all kinds of other um, information as part of the application process. So uh, I would be shocked if my colleagues ever issued a one-day liquor license where children would be present. Two, uh, just real quick, um, you know, this article is giving the town an opportunity to celebrate new facilities. That's what it was designed to do initially. Town meeting is seeing to add to that a little bit. That's fine. Uh, we will still be very uh, dif or not difficult, I guess, Tara, I apologize. We'll still be very thorough in our reviews, um, but folks from the library are the ones that also came to us to initiate this article. Thank you. Claire Wright, 28 Hayden Row. I just want to observe that I would certainly expect that a celebration of the opening of the library would have a large component of children. It is um, part of the reason this library expansion is being built is to serve all the children um, in our community. They're one of the best customers. Um, DPW, I can't imagine what little kid wouldn't want to go to the DPW and see all the big trucks. Uh, these are two events that I would expect children should be welcome at. So, um, you know, where the alcohol fits in, I'm not sure, but those are two events that should be totally children friendly. <coughs> Mr. Moderator, nothing in this article would suggest we have to have only one event. There could be a daily event or a day event for kids. There could be an evening event where it would be adults only. There are ways to sort through those issues. Um, and I think uh, with town meeting support, when we issue the license, we will handle those things very appropriately. On my right, Todd Sestari, 19 Elizabeth Road. And Mr. Moderator, I'm not trying to get into a debate that should happen at a Board of Selectmen's meeting. But I can say from personal experience that when we do look at the one-day permits, uh, alcohol permits, uh, a question that constantly comes up is whether or not there will be uh, children present. And you know, there are times where we have debates, even uh, to the appropriateness of, you know, say, a booster club for an athletic team that is children, comprised of children, uh, having a fundraiser that is promoting alcohol. And I say promoting just in the sense of uh, to get people to buy tickets or what have you. Um, you know, so we have debates like that, and we're very cognizant of that. Uh, and you know, to be quite honest, if I were to hear that at the opening gala there were going to be children, then this would be, you know, it would be a no vote for me. Uh, so I think that the board is very cognizant of that. We're very careful, uh, and we are trying to promote a positive message among the youth as well. On my left. And Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, for a few years, I was chair of the town's 300th anniversary celebration committee. And we struggled with this quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we had hoped to do as part of the 300th celebration was to have a dinner dance um, of some kind on the actual 300th anniversary of the town, which was December, in December. And it would have been an adult only, obviously an adult only event. And there was so much um, angst, I guess you will, about where we could have it. Could the town sponsor it? it we could not ask, peop ask people to spend, you know, 50 or $100 a ticket to come to something that they couldn't have alcohol at. So we were going to have to take the town's celebration 
out of the town. I mean, things like that. I don't think anybody is saying that we're going to have this great Oh, you know, opening for the library and we're not going to invite kids, of course we're going to invite kids, but there may be, as Mr. Herr alluded to, a, a, a daytime event for families and kids and then in the evening a gala that we could all support and, you know, keep the money and keep the people in the town. Thank you. On my right. Mr. Moderator, Dick Dugan, 38 Priscilla Road. I'd like to move the question, please. Is there a second? <clears throat> All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we've ended debate. And the article in front of us, Article 45, has been amended so that the Board of Selectmen may authorize events with no specified number during which alcoholic beverages may be served. All those in favor of the article as amended signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Let's, let's do that again and let's try not to shout. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. And it's a clear majority. Article 46, Kennels. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, we move the question as written in the motions document. Mrs. Lazarus is going to walk us through this proposed bylaw change. This a new kennel. This new kennel by law replaces the existing one. Still with can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I can get closer now. Uh, this new uh, kennel licensing bylaw replaces an existing one. The existing uh, bylaw is very short. It only talks about a penalty. Um, there's a much extensive section about kennel licensing and responsibilities and standards and definitions in state statute. So this bylaw codifies that, um, state statutory requirements in this bylaw and adds a few extra items such as some new definitions, um, specifically of humane and um, sanitary, and also um, provides for, it sets out an administrative process which is the same as it is today to get a kind of license, um, but it sets it out in writing so that those who are issuing licenses and those who are obtaining licenses have something in front of them that explains the process. The state statute is very disjointed and one has to go to a number of places to find out what you need to do. Um, in addition, it fully addresses what happens if there's a problem at a kennel, um, takes us through a process of addressing that and it's the same process that's in state statute. Are there questions? Mr. Moderator, Mike Cook, 34 Sanctuary Lane. Um, through you, Mr. Moderator, what is in the section suspension and revocation, depending upon the severity of the offense, I don't see any description of just how that's determined, who determines it, and subsequent to that, we have a petition of 25 citizens to create a hearing. Is there part of the state law that allows a petition of that sort? Ms. Lazarus? Yes, the state statute does provide for that 25 uh, uh, petition, 25 resident petition. And the severity issue? Uh, as indicated, it's up to the Board of Selectmen or the Animal Control Officer to determine uh, the severity of that offense. So we don't know 
specifically how they would do that? That's correct. A violation could be as um, minor as a missing record, or it could be something much more extensive. Thank you. On my left. Hi, Margaret Barton, 13th Sanctuary Lane. Is this time for comments, not so much a question? Yes. Okay. I, I stand in opposition to this on the grounds of the fines being raised exorbitantly. I mean, this is beyond corrective, it's beyond punitive, it's really vindictive. And we all know this is an extension of a witchcraft that's been carried out against a local dog shelter. And raising these fines to the maximum under the law, this is almost like mandatory sentencing without any discretion. And I think it's very dangerous because any disgruntled individual with an ulterior motive could start nitpicking or trump up charges and harass someone right out of business, especially an altruistic enterprise that's operating on a shoestring budget. You start socking them with $300 fines over and over, they'll be out of town in a, in a week for something maybe as frivolous as a paint chip on a wall. So I think this is a very dangerous level to put the, the fines at. And I feel this is a knee-jerk reaction to a fake scandal that is not motivated by goodwill towards animals, it's motiva motivated by ill will Let's, towards an individual. Yeah, we're not going to talk to, no. you know, we're, we're okay. talking to the, <clears throat> to this and not to motivations of individuals or, you know, okay, this is well, an article before us, so. Okay, I'm Let's. just, okay, I urge us to rise above this, what amounts to, I think, petty persecution and just do the right thing for animals and for their, their champions and vote no for this, because this doesn't seem like a, a really productive article as far as the fines go. On my right. Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. Um, I know we have kennels in this town, at least one, maybe more, that also take cats. And this simply calls out dogs. And I think that's a gross oversight. And that should be changed to something more inclusive. Thank you. Sir. Elena, any comment? The uh, state statute only addresses uh, kennel licenses for dogs and not cats. On my right. Brendan Tedstone, Pleasant Street. Um, so as a member of the Board of Selectmen, I was one of the ones that uh, made the suggestion for the um, fines to be put to where they are. Um, I'm a firm believer that if the fines aren't <coughs> substantial that there's really no reason to like if a fine doesn't hurt you financially or or in somehow there's really no no motivation to stay within the, the letter of the law and i will assure you that this had nothing to do with a certain kennel this is on on my suggestion it had nothing to do with a certain kennel this has to do with the with the entire the, the broad policy of it so that's why i, I personally like the thoughts of the of increasing the fines to make people uh, kind of toe the line, or there's going to be a substantial substantial penalty. Thank you. Susan Rostick, Five Baker Lane, and president of the Bay Path Humane Society. Um, I think that violations of animal welfare need to be taken very seriously, and as such, I'm in full support of the article has written, including the fines. Jackie, po Jackie Poninzoni, 12 Wood Street. I just have a question on a pack or collection of dogs on a single premise, including the commercial boarding or training kennel. Um, how many dogs are in a pack? What, what would that apply to? For Ms. Lazarus. The state statute requires a kennel license for four dogs or more. Does, does that apply to a private residence or just a kennel that like adopts it, dogs out? It can be a private residence. In fact, I think most of the kennel licenses, licenses are issued to individuals, um, but there are exceptions for uh, breeding and, and so forth. So the state statute defines those terms. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, <clears throat> I sense that we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 46, kennels as presented, signify by barking aye. <laughs> Any opposed? No. And it's clear majority. 
and passes. Article 47, Construction, Waste, or Debris Bylaw. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 47 as written in the motions document. Mrs. Lazarus is going to walk us through this change, suggested change to the general bylaws. This is a new bylaw that was originally generated by the Zoning Advisory Committee in its discussions um, regarding some issues that have come up over the years. Um, and in its discussion, it came up with a couple of alternatives. One of those was a uh, zoning bylaw provision, and one of them was a general bylaw position, uh, provision, which uh, it forwarded one to the Planning Board and one to the Board of Selectmen. Um, and each considered it, and so the one uh, before you today is a general bylaw provision. Um, so it establishes a means to manage construction waste or debris uh, that's brought in from on-site locations to a lot in the town. And if that construction waste or debris is going to remain on the lot for more than 30 days, um, it needs to be screened uh, so that it's not visible from abutting property uh, or neighbors. Um, and it can be done by walls, fences, or plant materials. Um, it doesn't apply to the placement of materials if it's necessary to a legally operating use, such as a business. Um, and it's enforced by the Director of Municipal Inspections with an appeal procedure um, that's local as opposed to um, the first step being appealed to Superior Court. So there's an appeal procedure to um, a group of individuals that would meet in town. Um, the goal is to have this tool available should a neighborhood be faced with a kind of situation um, that it might ha result in a negative um, impact on the area and it focuses on screening and managing rather than punishing someone for having this on their property. Are there questions? <coughs> uh, Leanne Latavis West, 48 Blueberry Lane. We moved here six years ago. And <coughs> I have now what I could officially call a junkyard I live behind. Um, Mr. Herr knows about this. We've addressed this to the town. Um, and to today, I wish there were more trees behind me, actually. It looks like World War III. Um, I understand the homeowner is trying to build something. He has for 20 years from the past owners that own my house. Um, it's still not building, and we're still seeing more stuff come in. Are there other questions or comments? Mr. Shepard. Uh, Mike Shepard, 11 Hill Street, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'll speak to the article, but first, um, <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the hard work and thank on the behalf of the town of all our volunteer and elected <laughs> boards and committees. They spend copious amounts of their free time making Hopkins in a town which can, we can be proud. And also a special thanks to the paid staff as well, the police, the fire, the DPW, the schools, the town hall staff. We as citizens don't often get the opportunity to thank you for all the hard work you've done. And thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> as you know, I don't get up here very often. And when I do, I, it's usually something that, that I think is fairly important. Um, Muriel is going to stop me when I get to two minutes, but I'll address the article now. Um, I want to encourage town meeting to vote no on this article. One of the selectmen at a recent event, um, I think it was the Educate Hopkinton program, described the need as a million dollar home who has a neighbor that's kind of sloppy, that it devalues the property of the million dollar home. It, it was pretty simple. Um, and um, I, I want to advise that, that <clears throat> I've been around long enough to notice that when we get an issue that seems unsolvable, the government seems to rise to the occasion and we'll just make a new bylaw and we'll fix it for you. I don't think a bylaw, any bylaw, this one included, will fix this issue. This is more about an issue about neighbors not talking to neighbors. And I don't you know, not this case specifically, but it happens all over town. Usually what happens is a neighbor sees something they call the building department, because after all, we do zoning and building, we should talk about you know, unregistered vehicles and all that kind of stuff too. And um, my first question to the people that call and complain is, have you talked to your neighbor? 
no, no, why would I do that? Um, I, I, and that's the basic problem. Most of these issues can be resolved by that. A person that has a million dollar house, if in fact it was a million dollars house, may have the opportunity to build a fence in their backyard so they don't see this nasty guy's thing. This nasty guy in the back pays his taxes, he's a citizen of Hopkins, he's, he's done all the right stuff. He just, you know, his house is a little sloppier than everybody else's. Um, there have been many changes in town over the years, most of which are really good, and this issue has seemed to come to the forefront. People don't speak to one another. Uh, neighbors, whether because they work hard or otherwise are too involved to reach out. I encourage neighbors to call one another before we get involved. Uh, make an effort to find out what's going on. And perhaps <clears throat> they don't have the money to clean it up or to build a fence, but if it's that important to you that they clean it up, perhaps you could help them out as well. You may have the financial wherewithal to say, look it, I'll bring a dumpster down, we'll be there on Saturday, I'll help you load it up. That may be all it takes. And I say, without us doing a bylaw, most of these things could go away. There's a couple of examples. Um, the, uh, I had a call from a, a citizen in town from down at the lake, and they called and said, the neighbor's in the backyard stringing rope all over the yard. You gotta go down and find out what he's doing. So I was just intrigued, nothing to do with building, probably nothing to do with zoning. I said, what the heck is this guy doing? I went down and I knocked on the door. I says, what are you doing? She says, Mike, it's a clothesline. Great. I called the guy up back and says, your neighbor is putting up a clothesline. This is something that these two neighbors side by side could have talked about, but <clears throat> they didn't. I told him it's a clothesline. He says, what? You mean I got to look at their sheets and stuff hanging out there all the time now? I says, yeah, that's right. You got it. Um, we live on Hill Street. Hill Street is Mike. kind of a blessed section of Hopkinton that you know, we're kind of off by ourselves. And, um, Mike, to the, to the article. Yep, it is to the article. We're over two minutes. We have, under, we have understanding neighbors. I'm almost there. I'm not going to get up again. Um, we have understanding neighbors. When the kids were little, we had sheep, goats, chickens. We had all this stuff. And the, the ducks would go across the street and eat Catone's grass all the time. And, and everybody thought it was great. The neighbors thought it was fine. Barbara called us one day and says, Mike, you got to get over here. I said, I go over across the street. And there were the ducks swimming in Catone's pool. They were okay with that, and we got the ducks out of the pool, but again, they didn't have to call the animal control officer, they didn't have to call the building department, they just, just called me across the street and we got it fixed. We had another occasion where a guy had too many unregistered cars. So again, the neighbor called, I'll say, I'll go out and take a look at it. I don't know anything about unregistered cars. If it's got no plate on it, I assume it's not registered. I don't know why the police don't do that, but the building department does that. So I knock on the door and I said, look at I'm here. Somebody's complaining because you get too many unregistered cars outside. And he says, Mike, he says, you know, and I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this, but a year ago, my son was killed in the crash. This was the car that he was taking care of and fixing up. I, I don't feel as though I want to get rid of it. And I told him, you don't ever have to get rid of it as far as I'm concerned. And it closed. Again, the neighbor could have had that conversation, and I would have been out of it. So all I want to say is, you know, Huffington is a great town, and I love it to death. But the, the, what we're losing is the communication between neighbors and, and people, and we're depending upon government to fix everything. Government can't fix everything. And as a society, we've got to do a better job. And, uh, and I thank you for the, allowing me to continue. I'll sit down. On my right. Dick Dugan, 38 Priscilla Road. I'd like to make sure I understand the, uh, the offenses and the penalties. I, I know this sounds silly, but I'm not quite sure what the difference is between the second violation of the first offense and the second offense, each day for each offense being a separate violation. I, when, wh what constitutes a second violation of each day, you know what I mean? Do you want, Ms. Lazarus, do you want this or town council? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All the hard ones come to the stage. Coward. <laughs> Each, uh, so a second, a, a violation that occurs on a particular day is the first offense. If it continues on to a second day, it's the second offense, and after that it becomes a third offense. Okay, through the moderator. Yes. Then there can never be a second day of the first offense, even though it says with each day being, right? 
Yeah, it, it's, my interpretation is, you know, the same offense, four days is not $100. It's 25, then 50, then 100, then 300. Okay, that's, I, I don't think it's clear that that's what that says, but. Ray, do you feel that? I guess I would say that this is going to depend on the particular circumstances um, um, the, that, are, um, that are before the, um, the town at a particular, in a particular instance. Um, the, uh, each day being a separate violation says to me that a second, uh, that a uh, violation is that continues on to a second day is a, is a separate violation and therefore is the second it would be uh, a second violation that's what it says to me but it doesn't necessarily mean that that the penalty will be imposed in that way on my left uh, Leanne Latavis West 40 Blueberry um, I agree something has to be done I me personally I feel like I'm living uh, in a war zone every day. I have tried with neighbors, a, this particular neighbor, even before um, getting attorneys involved. He's not very nice, I will leave it at that. And <clears throat> I know in previous conversations from previous neighbors, he's even dropped a, a lot of swears and I'll leave it at that. But he, something's gotta get done. I can't live looking at you know, letting my kids outside playing and looking at this junkyard that's behind me. That's the only way I can explain it. But I, it, I didn't move into the town of Hopkinton to have a surprise in my backyard. And it seems like it increases every day. So it doesn't go away, but something definitely has to get done. On my right. Jackie Potenzoni, 12 Wood Street. I live in downtown and I bought this old house and I've done many years of construction on my house and Mike Shepard, our building inspector, can you know, validate my construction. And there's been times that I would have been in violation because I have to wait to either get a dump truck to bring it to the dump or I have to get, fill my minivan and bring it to the dump to d dump it because it's when you're doing construction, it's a process. So. This is kind of restrictive for, for people who are doing construction in a lot of the work we've done ourselves and I've worked with contractors and, you know, if you're doing work on your house and you're being fine, you're trying to beautify the community and work on your house. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on my house, making my house better, adding to the community and putting this bylaw in effect would hurt people like myself that have tried to fix our house up and do the right thing. And sometimes you just have to leave it there for more than 30 days until you can get a dump truck or a dumpster and get rid of it. So I uh, do see- can I, can I point out that uh, you know, the, the specific language in the, in the bylaw, any construction waste or debris brought from off-site locations. So, so the interpretation is that if you're creating on-site um, debris, that's not covered by this bylaw. It's, it's not covered by construction that you're doing on the property. Yes. Okay, all right. So you're, if people are bringing stuff to the property and dumping it. Yes. All right, thank you for clarifying that. On my left. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Uh, as a member of the planning board, we did discuss this, and I did have some concerns. Um, but Mr. I want to thank Mr. Shepard for his uh, viewpoints and expertise and history that he's brought forward on this. And uh, I stand in opposition to this article, and um, I think everything he said was pretty important. I second what he said. Thanks. On my right. Kevin Shea, 11 Lowell Drive. 
I also second what Mike Shepard had to say. This town is what it is because there's 15,000, well, there's probably 4,000 homes here. And they're never going to be the same, and they're never going to be the way we want somebody else's property managed the way we would. <clears throat> and you know, I'm looking at some property now, and I go on Google, and I look at the neighborhood. I know what I'm getting into. Because um, it's available. It's, it's, it's there. But I, I would also say that over the years of coming to t town hall, there have been multiple warrants like this trying to solve an, an individual problem. And uh, unintended consequences of these kinds of acts are unknown. That's why they're unintended consequences, unknown. Uh, so I, ri I rise in opposition to this, and I would like everybody uh, to understand that this is a rural community. There are wild animals in people's yards. Well, I shouldn't say wild, but you know, it's, there's all sorts of stuff that happen here. So I uh, see nobody else here. I'll, I'll move the motion. I love Hopkinton, by the way. You can't move the motion after you speak to it. <clears throat> but seeing no other discussion, <laughs> we will end debate. And I'll call for a vote. All of those in favor of Article 47 as presented indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, let's stretch our legs again. All those in favor, please rise and hold your green card up. Stage. Center rear eight. Center rear eight. Center front twenty two. Center front twenty two. On the right, fourteen. Fourteen on the right. Moderator left, twenty five. Left 25, 78 total. Okay, all those opposed, please stand and hold your card. Five on the stage. Center front four. Center front four. Center rear 12. Center rear 12. On your left, 11. 11 on the left. On your right, 16. 16 on the right. 48, motion passes. 78 to 48. Okay, Article 48, discharges the storm drain system. Mr. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 48 as written in the motions document. Mr. Westerling is gonna walk us through the article. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, town meeting. Uh, this is a new bylaw which was drafted by town council and it's required by the Environmental Protection Agency to ensure that we are in compliance with their MS4 permit. 
which they uh, will become effective July 1st. Uh, I'll give you a very basic description of what this does. Uh, it prevents threats to the public water supplies, the environment and wildlife and recreational water bodies. And I'll just read the purpose. Non-stormwater discharges in the municipal storm drain system can harm water quality and create public health hazards. The purpose of this chapter, 171, is to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the town of Hopkinton through the regulation of non-stormwater discharges into the municipal drain system. When you hear that, please think of, for example, a resident pouring waste oil into a catch basin. Uh, a couple of things that this does not cover, which you would probably typically be doing in your, on your own property. It does not cover landscape irrigation, uncontaminated pumped groundwater, foundation drains, water from crawl space pumps, footing drains, <laughs> individual residential car washing, or dechlorinated swimming pool discharges. Um, as a final note, I did review this with the planning board at their meeting last week, and the planning board did approve this bylaw. Are there questions? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 48 as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 49, driveway standards. Chief Slayman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move the question is printed in the warrant article and the motion document. So why the change? Uh, I'm initiating direct is, involvement. Is there, Excuse me. is there a second? Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, why the change? We're uh, initiating a direct involvement in the driveway design and acceptance process. The goal? This policy will assist developers and designers in meeting the requirements for department access by defining terms and list minimum design standards considered necessary to access private driveways and provide effective public safety operations. Thank you. Chief, I'll start with the first question. Um, <clears throat> let's suppose my driveway was in, in need of repair or replacement. Um, pre-existing driveway, do I need a permit for reconstruction of that driveway? No, I'm just attempting to the future driveways that we're going to build in Hopkinton. Um, our experience is we've accepted and designed some driveways that we can't access properly. So my goal is public safety uh, is to make sure any new driveways constructed for new construction um, meet that need of public safety access. Thank you. Are there other questions? Mr. Rogers. Andre Ralph Rogers, uh, for Laurel Avenue. Um, <clears throat> what about a, um, <clears throat> a private road and a, um, um, an unaccepted uh, road by the town? <clears throat> Chief. So I'm, I would have to just start going through the process. I would look to uh, the planning board and the bylaws of the town cover most of the driveways. When we get to a private access road, I'd almost have to see what's the example, how does it fall in. So it, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Mr. Weismantle, do you want to address that? Ken Weismantle, 145 Ash Street, speaking as chairman of the planning board. If there's a private way that is uh, needs to be improved, the planning board sets reasonable standards for the uh, improvements to be made. And that would probably be whatever width we can perhaps get through there. We've had a couple of these in the last couple of years where uh, there's been a subdivision, or well, the subdivision was done in the 1800s and you know the roadway was created but there was no really road there other than a car cart path and then somebody decided to build three homes off of it so we set the standards for the construction of the road up to the best we could do for uh, town standards but if if um used used davenport village development as an example it is at this point a private way unaccepted by the town 
the planning board have input both as i assumed it had input as to the way did it have been put as to the driveway yes we fully approve that development it will not be a a public way that's actually a a driveway i guess a glorified driveway in in a condominium project thank you other questions okay seeing none i'll ask for a vote all those in favor of article 49 as presented indicate by signifying aye aye all those opposed clear majority article 50 unregistered motor vehicles mr her mr moderator mr ted stone <coughs> we move that the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town of hopkin and as set forth in article 50 at the town at the annual town meeting warrant an explanation so what what this uh, article does is it's an existing article in uh, in chapter 188 in the Re unregistered motor vehicles and the general bylaws and it just it basically increases the fines for twenty dollars from each offense up to it, it has sequential offenses that uh, increase in severity first offense goes from 20 to 25 dollars second offense to 50 third offense to 100 and fourth and subsequent offense to 300 are there questions and keep in mind mike shepherd said he would not speak again to this <laughs> please <laughs> okay all those in favor of article 50 as presented signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed no. let's try that again <clears throat> all those in favor signify by saying aye aye opposed no Ooh, i think we better stand all those in favor raise uh raise your stand and raise your green cards stage <clears throat> 24 on your left 24 on the left center rear 12 center rear 12 on the right, 19. 19 on the right. Center front, 21. 21, center front, total 87. 86, 87. Okay, uh, all those opposed, please rise. Three on the stage. Center front eight. Center front eight. Center rear seven. Center rear seven. On the right, eight. Eight on the right. On your left, seven. Seven on my left, 33. So it passes 87, 33. Thank you. <clears throat> Article 51, gift of land, Hens Farm Way. Mr. Weismantle. Ken Weismantle, 145 Ash Street, speaking as chairman of the planning board. I move that the town vote to authorize the board of selectmen to accept a gift of an interest in property as described in article 51 in the warrant articles and motions document this article will allow the town to accept a gift of 4.9 acres of open space created in the hens farm sub subdivision this land connects open space the town already owns and 
in, and is adjacent to uh, the back end of Center School on, on the south portion of that. So you'll be able to connect into the Presswick uh, uh, open space around there. And we have the approval of the Board of Selectmen and capital improvements as well. Yes. Are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions? All those in favor of Article 51 as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it passes. <clears throat> Article 52, Gift of Land, Box Mill Road. Mr. Weissmantel. Ken Weissmantel, 145 Ash Street, speaking as Chairman of the Planning Board. I move that the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to accept a gift of an interest in property as described in Article 52 of the uh, Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article will allow the town to accept a gift of 10.2 acres of land off of Leonard Street, where three lots were created off an old paper street. The land is uh, immediately adjacent to the uh, playing fields behind the uh, middle school and is also adjacent to the upper Charles Trail. Are there any questions? <clears throat> okay, all those in favor of, of uh, accepting this gift of land on Box Mill Road, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 53, street acceptances for the planning board. Uh, select them. Mr. Herr. <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. Moderator, Article 53, we move the article as it written in the motions document. Okay, and capital improvements? Capital improvements approves. Planning board as well? Planning board approves. Any commentary, Mr. Herr? Mr. Moderator, the Board of Selectmen <coughs> held a public hearing to uh, uh, take do our part to accept these roads. Uh, so this is the final step in the process for town meeting to do the same. Are there any questions about these road acceptances? to understand this a little bit more in please, detail. Uh, please identify your name oh, and street address. Oh, I'm sorry. Address. Uh, Meena Bharat, uh, 230 Nash Street. Go my, ahead. My question is, I, I'd like to understand this a little bit more. It's not very clear to me what the proposal here is. Mr. Herr, could you um, explain what street acceptance means? So street acceptance means the roads that were put in by a developer at some point <coughs> will then become the property of the town of Hopkinton. And we've been working uh, on a list of roads that have been developed over many, many years that for whatever reason weren't accepted at the time, perhaps they should have been. And we're walking through that process now uh, on an annual basis, working with the, our colleagues in the DPW and the planning board. And this was the list for this year. Uh, these roads were developed some time ago and we're just getting it done now. And what, what, what is the consequence of a street that is accepted versus a street that has not been accepted? We formalized the ownership of the road, and we also formalized the maintenance of that road. And uh, while these roads had been maintained for many, many years, and perhaps you may live on one of the roads, uh, you've seen the DPW trucks going by. Uh, technically, that shouldn't have been the case, but obviously we take care of our neighbors, and this just formalizes cleaning up sort of an administrative snafu in the past. I have a follow-up question. Would there be further discussions uh, around this? Would there be, um, you know, folks living on the streets talk discussing this any further? How does it work? I'm sorry, I'm near to the process. No, uh, it, this is the the time for discussion. I think, <clears throat> generally, I think people view street acceptance as a positive, okay. because ultimately, if there is repair that's necessary for a street which has been accepted, that would fall under the auspices of the town where I believe that if a street has not been accepted and repair was required, it would fall to the homeowners on the street to undertake those repairs on their own. Nickel. I see. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? All right. All those in favor of the street acceptance, Article 53, as presented, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. 
Article 54, easement at 125 East Main Street. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 54 as written in the motion's document. Mr. Westerling will explain. Through you, Mr. Moderator, this will allow the town to acquire an easement of less than 600 square feet from the Mezit family on East Main Street, which will allow us to construct the final phase of our sidewalk program. Are there any questions? Okay, all those in favor of Article 54 as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's uh, unanimous. <clears throat> Article 55, Fruit Street Property, Lease to Youth Organization. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Mrs. Wright. <coughs> Is on? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we move the motion for Article 55 as written in the motions document. Um, if I could just speak to this for a moment, this article and the following as well both pertain to what is identified on the Fruit Street Master Plan as Parcel 8. Um, this is the parcel that has always been had identif unidentified uses. Um, both in the original Fruit Street plan and in the subsequent upstate updated master plan. Um, for those in the audience who were here when the original Fruit Street property was purchased, the purpose of that piece of land was always to meet present and future community needs. And um, parcel eight is about a 30 acre parcel <coughs> and both of the uses being proposed in this and the following article would each encompass probably about a five acre parcel so there is ample room to meet um, both proposed needs. Are there any questions? Karen Bograd, 7 Sterling Drive. And I am also a member of the board of HSLA, part of Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts in town. Um, my first question is, is there a reason why this article specifies a 30-year lease on the land? Mr. Herr or Mr. Kamala? Mr. Mieris, if you could help us with that, please. <clears throat> The 30-year lease is what, we, what the town has traditionally used when it leases property to a, um, uh, an entity. That's the term that was used uh, for the uh, Center, Hopkins Center for the Arts. It was the term that was used for the um, uh, ice hockey rink that did not materialize. So this was just in keeping with those other leases. Thank you. Now, my other question is, are we sh sure that this lot is buildable? Does the town have any specific records around any prior testing done? Like, for instance, soil, wetlands, vernal pools, <coughs> floodplains? Um. Yeah, through the yeah, through the town moderator, we do not have any specific information. However, I should mention, when the town first planned for this land uh, back when the town purchased Fruit Street parcel. It was earmarked for housing. However, that can answer to your questions, we do not have any specific plans showing soil testing and uh, laying out the wetlands. Thank you. One more question. Uh, given the fact that this article um, and 56, which is up there, um, have kind of been set out together, um, has the town envisioned, or how does the town exactly envision apportioning the property between the two organizations that are referenced in these two articles? Uh, yes. Two thoughts. Um, one, the town is always very diligent in planning uh, parcels that uh, are at its 
at disposal or under its control. So there will be a thoughtful, deliberate planning process. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, in account of the conversations that we have had with the entities that might be interested, we believe that there's sufficient land to more than accommodate the needs of those two entities. Thank you. Um, before we have other discussion, I, I neglected to ask Capital Improvements if they had made a recommendation with respect to this article. Uh, capital Improvements approved. Thank you. On my left, Mr. Markey. Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street. Uh, Mr. Moderator, could, could we get a, a brief refresher on what we did with this property, uh, I think it was last year? I just wanted to get a refresher on what, what it was. Didn't we uh, authorize purchase of this for use by the scouts, or was it purchased to lease to the scouts, or how, what, how does this build upon or differ from what we did last year? Thank you. Mr. Kamala. Through the town moderator, the discussion last year was in regard to the Pratt Farm. Uh, the question before you tonight is not on the Pratt Farm, it's about the Foot Street parcel, uh, specifically parcel identified as parcel eight under the Foot Street master plan. So we're talking of two different parcels. On my right. Mr. Moderator, Jerry Kazanjan, 29 Elizabeth Road. I'm also a member of the board of the HSLA. Um, through you, I guess, to, to Mr. Markey, um, you know, so the HSLA is a uh, organization that dates back to 1949 here in uh, town of Hopkinton, nonprofit organization organized to support and enhance the town's scouting op opportunities and programs. And one, one objective to achieve that purpose is to provide uh, an opportunity for scouting groups to have meeting spaces and facilities. Uh, and so in the course of scouting's over 100 year history in the town of Hopkinton, we've developed a mutually beneficial relationship uh, where the town has benefited from scout service activities and general community involvement and scouting has benefited from the town's generous support. Uh, and so certainly we're grateful that the town in 2015 uh, supported us and scouting with the vote to buy the Pratt property in part for the HSLA's benefit. Um, under the deed restriction placed on the land by the Pratt estate prior to the town's acquisition, the HSLA has exclusive use of a portion of the land on the Pratt estate, Pratt farm, uh, for construction of a scout house and associated parking and other facilities, which could benefit scouting and the town in general. Um, the HSLA's actual use rights in the land is governed by our cooperation agreement that we've signed with the town, which sets out our respective rights and responsibilities and obligations. Uh, however, as a result of circumstances beyond the control of either the HSLA or the town, uh, including the potential for well sites on the Pratt property, it's become apparent that the Pratt par property may no longer be a viable site for the HSLA's intended use. Uh, while the HSLA board members each are fiduciary duties to our scouting youth, we also feel that we have a similar type of duty to the town as residents. And so to that end, we believe that the town's interest in securing viable, viable drinking water on the Pratt property may take precedence over the HSLA's scout house and may justify us relinquishing our rights in the Pratt property in favor of like rights in parcel eight. Um, so I do actually have an amendment that I would like to propose to article 55 in light of some of the answers uh, to the questions that were previously asked. Okay, do you have that in written form? Yes, and it's provided up on the screen. <clears throat> Okay, could you uh, at this point then speak to the uh, amendment that you're proposing? Sure, yes, yes, Mr. Moderator. Uh, so in the spirit of both the, disease, the deed restriction placed on the land by the Pratt Estate and the cooperation agreement with the town in order to maintain a similar level of equity in the land on which the HSLA uh, builds a scout house, we propose this amendment. So the land rights that the HSLA has in the portion, the undefined portion of land on uh, the Pratt Farm uh, is, is greater rights than a lease uh, in, in land. Uh, we have, it, there's no term attached to it. Uh, so we pr propose either that the town convey a portion of parcel eight or expand the term of the lease. Uh, the section there, the four term not to exceed 30 years should be uh, stricken. Um, it's, it's not showing up as deleted. Um, and we also want to ensure that um, you know, any efforts that we put forth for building a scout house um, 
and funds that we put forth for planning and uh, you know hiring architects and designers, engineers, uh, that we actually have a piece of land that uh, will will work for these purposes that uh, for the use that's intended. So that's the that's the uh, the last three lines of the amended uh, the amendment there. So uh, an amendment has been proposed. Is there a second? It has been seconded. Uh, we're going to take a one-minute break, and I, I need to discuss this amendment with town council. What, what aspect of that did the conveyance represent? is your call, not mine. I understand. But that, yeah. That's the way you drafted it, precisely to prevent this sort of thing. I mean, I, this sort of thing. I won't propose an alternative, but I, I will let him come back uh, if he's so inclined on a different term within some reasonable length of time relative to 30 years. Sure. All right. Yeah, that's All right, sorry for the delay, uh, but there, there are some uh, issues with the amendment in particular that, uh, that caused the amendment itself to be outside of the four corners of the article. Uh, in particular, the article as um, two issues. The article as uh, drafted said lease. Conveyance is something totally different than, than lease, number one. Secondly, the proviso that uh, any advertisement uh, obligates the town to do testing, there has been no money provided in the budget to do testing. So that becomes problematic as well. So I'm going to rule that the article, that the amendment as you have presented it is outside of the four corners of the, of the article that was uh, published. Mr. Moderator, uh, clarification, the, the amendment as a whole? Um, including the so, amendment providing for a 99-year renewable lease? 
Um, I'm going to dance around that a little bit. 99, uh, I, I do also believe that 99 years and, and renewable falls outside of you know, what would be um, a reasonable expectation of somebody coming to town meeting where it said not to exceed 30. That's not to say that uh, it has to be 30, but 99 feels um, somewhat too extended in light of what the reasonable expectations of people attending town meeting were with respect to this article. And Mr. Moderator, one further thing. I just would like to address a couple comments that I received when I went back to my seat, a couple questions, and the answer to those I think would benefit all of uh, town okay. meeting. Go ahead. Uh, just to clarify, the HSLA is an organization that supports not just Boy Scouts, but Brownies, <clears throat> Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and it is unique, in my opinion, among uh, similar towns that there is such a uh, nonprofit organization to provide mm -hmm. uh, kind of an umbrella type of support. Um, so that's uh, all I wanted to say on that right. note. Uh, what, what I, you know, what I was trying to convey without, uh, you know, putting specific words into an amendment on your behalf mm -hmm. is that, you know, certain amendments would be considered within the four corners of the article, but the three specific amendments that you have uh, presented to town meeting, I believe, fall outside of the scope of the article uh, as it was presented in the warrant. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wisemantle? In the Wisemantle, 145 Ash Street. If you put the slide up of the Fruit Street parcel, um, I believe Section 8 is all upland, if, if that was the concern of the last paragraph. All the, the green portion, which was CR, contains all the uh, wetlands on, on the parcel. So you, I, I, as far as I know, eight is very much upland uh, area. Uh, John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. Some of my most proudest moments of being on the Board of Selectmen were not necessarily those that moved the town forward. They were seeing some of our young men and women achieve these golden gold, Eagle Scouts and Gold Awards. We have an inordinate amount of uh, top scouts coming out of Hopkinton. And it truly is a testament to uh, the many in our community that have uh, volunteered to make them such. I fully support this, uh, this article. The, um, section, the, the uh, section 8 up there has no designation. And uh, there couldn't be a much better uh, place for these, uh, these two uh, places for the uh, youth. Thank you. Cherry Kazanjan, 29 Elizabeth Road. Uh, going back to the previously submitted amendment, if, uh, could we change that to a 50-year lease, 50-year renewable, rather than the originally proposed 99-year? <clears throat> Would you, um, it, the part to me that, that feels like it's outside of the uh, uh, bounds of the, of the article is the renewable aspect. I would accept 50 years. I would not accept renewable as part of that term. As, as town council has indicated, that feels like it's indefinite. Would the renewal terms be something that is up for negotiation during the RFP process and the, the uh, bid submissions so that that can be negotiated at that time? No. What, what the, I, I the, think the, town R council. The RFP would have to be in accordance with the vote of the town meeting. So if, so this vote if it do, so if it doesn't specify renewable here, then it can't specify that renewable in the RFP and it can't be the subject of negotiations. This limits the authority of the Board of Selectmen to enter into a lease agreement. So, my, Mr. Moderator, my follow-up question to that is if the intent of this article is to provide a piece of land for the HSLA to build a scout house, and you know, the HSLA has been in existence in the town of Hopkinton for almost 70 years, has been scouting involved in Hopkinton for over 100 years, how is it reasonable f to expect the HSLA to expend hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in building a facility like this for our youth without any sort of expectation that we have at least an opportunity to 
renew the lease on which the, uh, for the land on which the building is constructed. Well, two, two comments. One, you, you would, uh, any organization would have the opportunity to um, come back before the Board of Selectmen at the end of that 50-year term or 30-year term, whatever. But, <clears throat> you know, the thing that we have to provide within town meeting is reasonable notice to the residents of the town as to what's going to be uh, under discussion at town meeting. And in the way that this article was drafted, the expectation was that, that um, the term would be 30 years and that there would be no renewable concept. That doesn't prevent the organization from coming back uh, at the end of the, the lease term, whatever it might be, and asking for the opportunity to continue uh, using that facility under a, under a new lease. But Again, we're, we're bound by what the expectations of the, of the voters of the town are when the article is presented to town meeting, when it's been drafted, when it's presented to town meeting. And to make it indefinite really does change the nature of the consideration that we're asking the, the town to, uh, to, to vote on. So, Mr. Moderator, uh, with all due respect, pr just a short time ago, we did expand the rights upon which the Board of Selectmen can grant three uh, special li li liquor licenses to an unlimited number of licenses. Uh, I appreciate that. I think that circumstance is quite different where, you know, three, three might become four or five, three might become one or two in a given year. Uh, that's all under the control of the Board of Selectmen each year, and, and I would not view that as something which is directly parallel to, uh, to this circumstance. So I, I would ask whether you're interested in, in uh, following through with your amendment on the 50-year term without regard to a renewable concept. Um, yes. Okay. So you, you are proposing an amendment. Uh, to an amendment to the proposed amendment. Well, no. That proposed amendment was ruled out of order. No. So this is an amendment. No. We have to put it. So this is an amendment which yes. simply replaces the, the term not to exceed 30 years to, to say for a term not to exceed 50 years. Is that your understanding? Yes. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. second. Is there discussion on that amendment? Yes. On my right? Muriel was up. I know. I don't want to oh. talk to the amendment. We'll get to Muriel. Uh, Connie Wright, 25 Amherst Road. I guess I need some clarification why this is a warrant before us and we can't have the term renewable um, because we're asking a group to expend incredible capital and it puts them at risk that the town could turn around and say, oops, 30 years are up, we want the property now. And, and so I don't understand and it has not been made clear to me why we could not accept the language under the first proposed amendment. I, 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 I heard opinions. I did not hear fact. I'll take my answer. Please. Well, in, in this context, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask town council to, to respond. In this context, the moderator's opinion is fact. But <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Meares will, uh, will give you the legal reason. Okay. so. Whether or not it's a good idea to have a renewable lease or a bad idea to have a renewable lease is not something that is relevant to, to the question that is before the moderator now. So it might have been a very good idea um, when, the, uh, when this article was being drafted for someone to, uh, to suggest that the terms be different. But these are the terms that, um, that appear in the, uh, in the warrant. Now, the purpose of the warrant is to give <clears throat> notice to all the citizens of what the transaction uh, before the town meeting is going to be. And uh, um, people have heard me talk in the past about the four corners. Any motion that is made needs to be within the four corners of the article. That is, it can't go off and, and address matters that are not provided for in the uh, in the warrant article, no matter how meritorious those terms might be, 
we have to stick to what's within the, uh, the four corners of the article. And the person who has exclusive authority to make that determination is the moderator. Um, so um, so uh, whether or not this, uh, that this results in, in a, uh, a motion that is uh, a good idea or not is not really before uh, the moderator. It's only a matter of what's included within the, uh, within the four corners of the article. Muriel. Yeah, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, I, I would like to first ask if you could speak, uh, Mr. Mieris, to the protections that the scouts were given in the original agreement and whether this article captures the, the equivalent protections for property use. It does not. The original uh, protections were granted by uh, by the Pratt family before they were um, before the property was conveyed to the town. They will not be extinguished by anything that happens here. Those con those rights continue to exist. The town does not um, uh, get um, uh, get the. Uh, uh, the restriction on that property removed by anything that's happening here. So it's two, two entirely separate concepts. Oh, well, now I have two more questions. Um, so in, in layman's terms, first of all, I think everybody here supports scouting, getting their due down at that end of town to do the wonderful things they do with the kids that they do it with. Um, tell me, can the scout, I, you just said that, that their, their rights to the property, the Pratt property, don't go away. So they can put their scout house there? Well, I understand that uh, as a matter of law, the answer is yes. I, whether they physically can do it, I think that's, that's the, the impetus for looking for an alternative, um, uh, for an alternative site. Okay, so I don't have any objections personally to them uh, being moved a few feet over to the Fruit Street property. Um, I would object to them not having an equivalency of right to a piece of property. It, this seems to me a problem for the town to solve for the scouts and make sure that the scouts get their due and their ability. And perhaps you could, is there a way to rescue this article so that the scouts' interests are protected fully? Well, when you say protected fully, I assume what you mean is so that, so that they, the scouts would be given the same rights on this property that they have on the, um, the Pratt Farm property. That's, that's, what right. you, that's what you're looking for. That's exactly for. right. And there could, an article doing that could have been placed on the warrant, but it just wasn't. So my question was, could, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry. Um, can this article be rescued to actually solve the problem for the scouts and for the town? Well, in a so, so best I can offer is you, you authorize a lease today and at a, in a future town meeting that authorization gets amended to include a conveyance or a longer term lease or, or a renewable lease, all of those things. And there's no legal prohibition against the town doing any of those things. They just didn't do it in this article. With, with a caveat. And the caveat is that, that if a lease, if, if this article or some form of this article passes and a lease is extended, uh, the town can't guarantee that the lease would be extended to the Boy Scouts or to the HSLA organization, right? Well, there, that, that is another caveat, which is to say we, <clears throat> town meeting does not have the authority to direct this land to be leased to any individual organization. There needs to be a competitive process 
uh, where proposals are received. We, the RFP can be written in a way um, that, I mean, it's already, the, the article already says that it's going to be for a, uh, for a youth organization based in Hopkinton. The RFP can, um, uh, can elaborate on, on those things. But the, uh, the state procurement laws do not allow the conveyance of land either by lease or, or in fee uh, without going through a, an RFP process. So we have to go through that process. So can I just ask one final question? I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, did people, you and the selectmen and the scouts work together to try and solve this problem? Or how did this come to pass? It sounds like it's a, it's a bit of uh, a Gordian knot. And further, I mean, what is, we want to protect the scouts' interests. We certainly want to protect the town's interests. What is the best way forward where they have rights to a piece of property um, and they are trying to get equivalency in rights and it's in the town's best interest to make that happen? How do we make it happen? Through the, Mr. Kamalo. Yeah, through the town moderator. Um, that's an excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did we get here? Um, I think we all acknowledge that there's a great relationship between the association and the town, uh, as evidenced by our conversations uh, surrounding the purchase of the platform. Um, why we got here specifically is I think we did not communicate well. Um, in terms of how we can resolve this, perhaps the question that has been asked uh, can be asked slightly differently. Uh, I, I, one of the reasons why I, I enjoy working for this community is the opportunity that I get to negotiate on behalf of the community. Uh, and I think in this case, because we have two entities that want to work together, want to find a solution to a, a common problem, uh, one question then that I would put forth, that I could put forth to town council is, assuming that town meeting approves the amended article, an RFP goes out, a response is received from the association, and because part of the motion tonight is requesting the selectmen uh, to negotiate a deal that it deems to be in the best interest of the town, through those negotiations, we identify a pathway that is then brought forth to a future town meeting. That's one way of resolving this issue. I'm sorry, people were talking on both, uh, um, uh, to me and from both sides. So the last thing you said, Norman, was? The process I'm recommending uh, to at least move this forward is that assuming town meeting approves the amended article, an RFP is sent out, the association responds, and during the negotiations with the selectmen, a pathway forward is identified that answers some of the questions that have come forth tonight. And that pathway then becomes a new article that is presented to a future town meeting. Absolutely. That's, that, that, that's basically what I, what I was saying was they can either, you could adopt this and move forward with this and then come back at a future town meeting and amend this to conform to whatever agreement uh, results from the RFP. The, it, it's not required for the town meeting to approve the, um, uh, the conveyance or the lease uh, ahead of time. It can do it after, either way. On my right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Kim Brennan, 151 Spring Street. Uh, I'm also a member of the board of HSLA, and I will be brief. I've already forgotten my first question. Um, <laughs> my second question was, uh, there's no dollar amount specified for the lease. Is that something that would be negotiated during the pro process of the RFP? Yes. Yes. And in fact, yes, the answer is yes. Is there more, Mr. Moderator? 
Do you have, do you have another question? It sounded like Mr. McCamalo. No, he answered it, yes. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. I think much of it was covered. Mr. Clark. Yes, Ron Clark, 8 School Street. Um, the article mentions Chapter 30B, so I did a little research on it today. And uh, Chapter 8 of Chapter 30B references uh, leasing uh, property, town property. Uh, page 100, 103 has a paragraph, Contract Terms and Conditions. And under that, it, it discusses uh, statutory or local restrictions. And it says, quote, for example, Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 3, limits towns to public building leases of 30 years and leases of schoolhouses in use as schools to 25 years, end quote. So my question is, can you really lease this for 50 years if there is this 30-year uh, restriction for public buildings. I know this is not a building, it's, it's land, but I would assume one would apply for the other. So that's well, my question before the, uh, before the court. And the answer okay. is? So the answer is it doesn't apply. <laughs> if you're not leasing a building, you're not restri restricted um, to the 30-year lease. Th that, uh, that restriction only applies when you're leasing a building. This is leasing raw land, so uh, the term can be specified whatever the town meeting desires. Thank you. On my right, Todd Sestari, 19 Elizabeth Road. What I'm wondering is, um, this is saying that we can lease this portion of parcel eight on such terms and conditions as the Board of Selectmen deem to be the be in the best interest of the town. Uh, if this passes and we go through the RFP process and HSLA is chosen, uh, why can't those terms of that lease uh, be the terms that are beneficial to the town and also ensure uh, the scouts uh, their protections as in the same agreement with the Pratt property. Again, we're, we're talking about something which is within the bounds of this article. And so the article itself uh, will establish certain bounds. You won't be able to negotiate something which is outside of those bounds. Well, it, it, Mr. Moderator, uh, it does say that the Board of Selectmen would be able to negotiate terms and conditions as they deem in the best interests of the town. But if, but if the term, uh, if this is uh, approved as amended or approved as originally written, the bylaws, uh, this, this article is going to say either 30 or 50 years. So that part of whatever you negotiate has to survive. You, you have the opportunity to you know, do, do whatever else you want in terms of conditions, but you won't be able to abrogate the term which is specified within, the, so, so within what town meeting passes. So any other protections that are provided in the current agreement would be able to be brought in as long as it doesn't change any of the terms that are specified here? That is my understanding, yes. That's correct. Thank you. Chen, 3 Nicholas Road. Uh, so are the citizens in this room allowed to vote on adding the word renewable? No. No, I've, I've ruled that the, the use of the word renewable causes this to be, uh, represents something which is outside of the bounds of the four corners of the article, and so it's something that cannot be considered. So if there's no further discussion, we're <clears throat> first voting to amend this article to substitute the number 50 as the lease term uh, for the 30 years which was uh, originally presented. All those in favor of incorporating the amendment which would extend the lease term to 50 years signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We're back to the main motion which has now been amended to incorporate a lease term of up to fit, not to exceed 50 years. Any further discussion on this article? Yes, Ron Clark, 8 School Street. Could the map of the uh, area be put back up on the screen, perhaps? Is that possible? <clears throat> there you go. Um, so section eight there, was approved for under future undefined uses uh, by the Board of Selectmen. 
and the town meeting uh, endorsed a, a plan, a proposal that, uh, that recommended a process uh, for how uses were solicited. So my question is, how did the Board of Selectmen determine that there is surplus property, and what process did the Selectmen use to go through and um, solicit requests for using that surplus property? Mr. Herr. Mr. Kamalo. <laughs> Mr. Mijares. Yeah, would you like me to try? <laughs> okay, so this is not a conveyance, this is a lease. So there's no requirement that the um, the property be found to be surplus, as it would be if this were a conveyance. And sur by surplus, we mean no longer needed for a public purpose. So, but because this is a lease, that requirement is not there. So, to my knowledge, the selectman never um, uh, even considered declaring it to be surplus. Um, the um, there has been no solicitation of um, uh, of bids. This would. One of the things that would would be authorized by this article is that there would be an RFP process. Thank you. I, I have I have no concern over the um, <clears throat> the proposed uses for this property either one. I think they're sort of a public purpose. I, I just have a concern about the process because you know Chapter 30B, um, page 98, says that before doing this, just develop an inventory of your local jurisdiction's property survey department heads and invite public comment. And it says before you can sell or lease property, regardless of its value, it must be declared available for disposition by the individual or body with the authority to make such a determination for your local jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure that has been followed. Maybe it will be followed in the future, but I'm not sure this, what's being written, chapter 30B, page 98, uh, is is being followed the vote that you are about to take is the authorization okay second question is it was mentioned that five of the 31 acres was going to be used i think for both um proposals or just just the boy scouts and where that Area eight is, is, is choice property. There's some folks that were asking about, hey, is, you know, can it be developed? And you know, we went through a lot of testing back in uh, 2002 to 2006 on this property. And NEPA approved like 100 senior market rate housing on there. So it was very developable land. Town considered selling it at one time. Uh, we, we're, you know, we, we've kept it for municipal purposes. Where on that site is this five acres going to go? Are there any drawings, any plans? You've got a, uh, a emergency access road that's shown towards the top of the property that must be maintained per our, our MEPA certificate approval. Um, do we know where this is going on the property? Do we have any plans whatsoever? <clears throat> Mr. Kamalo? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. If through the RFP process, an appropriate organization and suitable lists are agreed to, we will go through the planning process that we've identified. Okay. Um, last question is, will the town follow the solicitation process that's outlined in, in, in 30B? Uh, chapter 30B. And the reason why I ask the question is that there's language in Chapter 30B that talks about the property could be offered to promote a, a public purpose, which this is a fine public purpose, rather than to raise revenue, which is probably going to be the case here. And it also appears if the value of the lease is under $35,000, then the solicitation is not needed. So if you had a one year, a dollar a year lease for 50 years, you're under $35,000. And to me, the solicitation process is important. I think it's important to be, you know, for transparency for the town. I think it, it, the 30B lays out, you know, 11 items that should be in a lease. So can we have a commitment tonight that 
this will follow the solicitation process? So, but can, let me just clarify one point. In figuring out the value of the interest in real estate that's to be conveyed, the fact that it's going for one dollar, if it is going for one dollar, is not the relevant consideration. The relevant consideration is what does land of this size typically go in go for in a market. So, um, uh, so a 50-year lease um, of several acres of land is clearly worth more than $35,000. So it's not just that you need a commitment. The law requires that the full solicitation process be, be gone through. So there will be an RFP. It will specify what the specific um, criteria um, for selecting the winning bidder will be. Um, and um, the, uh, all of the steps that are set forth in Chapter 30B will, will be followed exactly. Uh, thank you, because because the language is um, can be you know construed different ways in 30B. I appreciate your commitment to the solicitation process. Um, I'm in support of this article. I, I just hope the planning process works smoothly, and for both these articles, we don't uh, pay ourselves into a corner, and that we can use the rest of that of that property aid area. And I hope uh, the selectmen uh, involve a um, a broad segment of the community to, to help them in that planning process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments, let's take a vote. We're voting on Article 55, having been amended to incorporate a lease term not to exceed 50 years. All those in favor of Article 55 as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 56, Fruit Street Property, Lease Mr. to Animal Shelter, Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Mrs. Wright. <clears throat> we move the motion for Article 56 as found in the motions document. And uh, you had a comment with respect to some of the written language within the article itself? Mr. Moderator, um, I have noticed that in the motions document, the language has been corrected. In, in the wording before the motion, you have language that says such land as an animal hospital or shelter. And I, I believe that uh, but the, the, motion the motion doesn't. As, as an animal yeah. For the benefit of, of those of you who are reading the article it's, itself, the motion is correct. There is a reference to an animal hospital sitting above the motion, which uh, you should ignore. It's been deleted. Is there a discussion or do you have a com any explanation on this, uh, Mrs. Wright? I do not, um, other than the uh, land we're talking about has already been sufficiently described in the discussion of the previous motion. Again, this is a 30-acre parcel and the needs for an animal shelter would um, be using a, an additional five acres separate from what the um, youth organization that we just discussed would be requiring. So there are two separate requests on one 30-acre parcel. Are there questions? Susan Rosnick, Five Baker Lane, and uh, president of the Bay Path Humane Society. Uh, we obviously have a very strong interest in this. Bay Path has been in town now for over 40 years. Uh, we've been a partner of the animal control officer. Uh, we've, uh, we adopt out and find homes for over 1,300 animals a year. And I certainly hope that we'll be considered a, uh, a candidate when this goes out to RFP. Uh, based on the prior conversation, I'd like to propose an amendment in which the uh, term not to exceed is changed from 30 years to 50 years, uh, consistent with the prior conversation. Thank you. Is there a second? Who knew that was coming? <laughs> uh, I neglected to ask Capital Improvements if they have a recommendation on this article. Capital Improvements approves. Okay. 
so there's an, an amendment which has been proposed. Is there discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, let's take a vote on the amendment. All those in favor of amending the, uh, the language to permit a term not to exceed 50 years signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Back to the original motion, uh, now as amended, to incorporate the 50-year term. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the article as amended to incorporate the 50-year term, or a term not to exceed 50 years, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous as well. Article 57, early voting, citizens petition. Is there uh, one of the citizens who's willing to speak to this to make the motion? Amy Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street. Um, I'm going to actually make a motion for no action on this article. Although it's near and dear to my heart, I'm a big advocate for voter um, engagement and making government accessible to citizens. After talking with the town clerk and learning a bit more, the, t the state experimented with early voting um, last fall for the presidential election, and there's, there are a lot of kinks to work out and the improvements that are gonna be made to early voting. So I don't think it's time to roll it out to the towns yet. It'd be better to wait to see what improvements the state has, so I would hope to bring this forward in a future year. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there discussion? Okay, seeing no discussion. The, the motion has been made to take no action on this article. So if you <coughs> vote in the affirmative, then this will not be implemented. All those in favor of taking no action on this article indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? and no action will be taken. Thank you. Article 58, Pilot Agreement, Mass Solar Highway Phase 1B LLC. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, given my professional responsibilities, I'm going to recuse myself uh, from the uh, sitting on the Board of Selectmen for Articles 58 and 59. Mr. Catino will preside. We move the uh, motion as written in the motions document. And some explanation, Mr. Catino. Yes, uh, this um, uh, <clears throat> second. special town meeting <clears throat> authorized the Board of Selectmen to negotiate payment in lieu of taxes, otherwise known as a pilot agreement, for solar energy products in the town, according with Section 38H of Chapter 59 of Massachusetts General Laws. Basically, this guarantees, it's a guarantee of real and personal property taxes that may not normally have been collected. It's a, it's a, it's a risk management to make sure that, that we actually get the money that would be due to us that uh, solar farms may not have had to pay us. Um, the solar companies were a willing participant and decided that they would uh, do these payments up front. And uh, through negotiations, they agreed to approximately $22.5 per kilowatt, which was a uh, uh, really great negotiation. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of this article, Article 58, as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 59, Pilot Agreement NRG DG Marathon LLC. Mr. Catino. We move the motion as written in the motions document. And if you uh, in, to speed up the Go ahead. process, I, I'm going to say exactly the same thing we said before. They're both the same. This was the. the uh, Into the microphone. Yeah. They're Can't once a 20 year, once a 25. Oh. Can't hear I'm you. Sorry. Once a 20 year, once a 25. So this is, it's exactly the same reasoning for both solar agreements to get the money up front, uh, reduce risk, and it was a very good negotiation. Thank you. Any questions on this one? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 59 as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 60, we're nearing the end. <clears throat> Set local speed limits 25 miles per hour. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Article 60, we move to take no action. And an explanation? There was a lot of discussion about how this would impact uh, how we move around town. 
um, and where it would apply and where it would not. Uh, we were not comfortable with moving ahead at this time given some of the unknowns and some of the concerns uh, shared by members of the board and uh, others in the community. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, Article 60, uh, setting local speed limits. All those in favor of taking no action signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. And it's a uh, clear majority. <clears throat> Article 61, set local speed limits, designated safety zones. Mr. Hur. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 61 uh, as written in the motions document. And uh, any explanation? Mr. Kamal is going to explain. Okay, through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the article actually responds to recent changes in state law allowing towns and cities flexibility and control around the establishment of speed limits. Uh, in particular, it allows for the creation of designated safety zones on, at, or near any way in the town that is not a state highway and with the approval of must DOT if the same is a state highway. Such safety zones would have a posted speed limit of 20 miles per hour and are intended to be used in areas where vulnerable road users, such as parks and playgrounds, senior citizen housing and centers, hospitals or other medical facilities, high school and higher education centers and daycare facilities are likely to be present. Uh, to establish a safety zone, Mass DOT has developed the following minimum criteria. Number one, the street should be adjacent to a land use that is likely to attract vulnerable road users. Number two, the safety zone should contain one or more areas that have potential conflicts between motor vehicles and vulnerable road users that warrant a <coughs> reduction in speeds such as crosswalks driveways or side streets. And finally, the minimum length of the safety zone should be at least one quarter of a mile and it should not extend more than 500 feet beyond a side street unless an applicable land use continues along the adjacent block. Um, in, in, in the discussions amongst the Board of Selectmen, uh, their support for this article uh, was predicated, I think was based on the fact that uh, if town meeting approves the article tonight, it means that the town will be opting in to this law. In addition, the, the selectmen found this a useful tool to add to uh, the town's toolbox in terms of addressing speed limits in the sense that designating safety zones will be based on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Are there questions about this article? Kevin Shea, 11 Lowell. Could you repeat, uh, could the distance of this zone be repeated? I did not understand it. Okay. The, yeah, the, the minimum length of the safety zone should be at least one quarter of a mile, and it should not extend more than 500 feet beyond a side street unless an applicable land use continues along the adjacent block. There's a, there's a defined area with an allowance of an extension of that limit should the appropriate conditions exist. So in, in essence, there'll be a, uh, just, just to clarify, there'll be a change in the speed limit for a quarter of a mile or maybe quarter of a mile plus 500 feet. Correct. Is that enforceable by law? Yes. Uh, it is. I'm not sure it is, but you know, I, I think the uh, police could weigh in on that. But uh, you have to have a certain amount of distance in order to penalize somebody for speeding, and I don't think it's a quarter of a mile. It may need to be longer. 
Yeah, throw the money. I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I don't think it's enforceable. Yeah, uh, throw the town moderator. Go ahead. These distances are, um, I, they are put forth by Mass DOT, which is the entity that also provides the basis of um, um, distances specified for speed regulated areas. Okay. On my left. Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick Road. Um, uh, this sounds like a great tool for the selection to have to, uh, to enhance safety. Uh, I can think of numerous areas where they might apply this. Um, have there been any specific zones that they've thought about uh, that they're willing to share uh, before we vote? Thank you. Mr. Kamalo? Yes, through the town moderator. One area that has come um, up in the discussions is the area outside the, the school zone, it's basically where we are now. Uh, all of us know that there is that gap between uh, the area that has the identified uh, speed limit of 20 miles per hour, and after that there is uh, an area that I think is 40 or 45 miles an hour, and with the coming of the marathon school, uh, there will also be a, a regulated speed of 20 miles per hour, so there is that gap in between the two schools, and that could be, uh, that could be an ideal area to, to implement a safety zone, uh, because we have crosswalks, we have schools. Uh, however, because this is a mass highway numbered street, uh, the, the process might be slightly different. Uh, the indications are that uh, the town may be required to undertake a speed study in order to implement this. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll um, entertain a vote on Article 21, excuse me, Article 61 as presented. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 62, constables. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Mr. Sestari. We move, we move the motion as written in the motions document. This motion is to see if the town will vote as provided in Section 1 and Section 1B of Chapter 41 of the Massachusetts General Law to make the position of constable an appointed instead of elected position to be appointed by the Board of Selectmen. Questions? Hi, I'm Frank Durso, and I happen to be running for the one-year constable seat. Um, I'm doing that in support of the idea of keeping constables elected. We currently have three elected constables. We'll have a full cohort of them after this next election. We have three appointed uh, constables. The idea, as, as explained to me, was that so we can always have constables on hand in town. Um, this will be the first year that we have all six. Um, last year we had a contested race for a constable. Uh, I think that it's important to keep p as many positions elected as there already are. And if there are any other problems in the wording of the constables in our bylaws, we can change them. But um, I don't think that this is the change that is needed. I'd like to ask uh, people to oppose this um, in order to keep three elected constables. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. Um, I just want to let people know how this article arose. Uh, the article arose from the charter review process where it was noted that the town has no bylaws regarding the election or appointment of constables. Uh, state guidance and statutes are rather minimal. Uh, I believe the state, state guidance is that the town needs to have a minimum of one elected constable unless a vote is taken otherwise, which tonight would provide. Um, at present time, Hopkinton has both elected and appointed constables. In the last 10 years, there have been four elections where we voted for constables, and two of those elections have had too few candidates to fill the seats that were available. On my right. Um, Amy Groves, 2 College Street. Um, would it be the case that if there are not enough people running for office that they would be appointed anyway by the selectmen? I'll refer to town council on that. No. Okay. Follow if, on if question. They, no, they, the elected um, 
positions would just remain um, would just remain vacant until the next election. On my left, Pam Waxlax, 15 Smith Road. I have a question first. What is the difference between an elected and an appointed constable? And the follow-on question is, what are the duties of a constable? An, an elected constable is one who is elected by the voters. An appointed constable. <laughs> Do you want me to continue? No, no. I'd actually appreciate an actual what the duties are. If there's a difference in duties between elected and appointed constables, there is no difference in duties. The constables are used to um, serve legal papers and to uh, post legal notices. That's the principal um, uh, uh, function of these um, uh, of the office. There's no, di no difference in the duties between elected and appointed. Follow-on question. Are there any requirements that could be required of a constable once elected? You mean, are there, do they have certain obligations? Or, or bonding or things like that. Oh. No, the elected constable, anyone who is uh, an eligible voter can, can um, um, get on the ballot and, and run. There are no specific criteria for qualifications or um, uh, uh, other characteristics. So finally, I'd like to speak in support of this article. I believe that um, given the lack of contested races in all the years and the lack of um, information in the bylaws with regards to the constables that this helps codify it and I would appreciate if we would just have appointed constables and maintain what is needed by the town only. Mr. Sestari. Todd Sestari, 19 Elizabeth Road. Uh, through the moderator to town council, um, would the board of selectmen through the appointment process, have the ability to require bonding of constables? Yes. Would that benefit the town in any way? <laughs> well, that's a political judgment, but um, um, requiring uh, bonds would be um, a potential mechanism for protecting the interests of the town. Okay, S sensing that there is no further discussion or questions. <laughs> Hiding behind the screen. Yeah, short. Um, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, I'm opposed to this. I'm actually married to one of the constables that was elected last year, but um, and has gone through the getting going, get joining a constables association, going through the whole bonding um, to be kind of above reproach. But I, I like the idea that. Some of this is left to the people to still decide upon, and um, maybe in the past there have been, you know, less um, people coming forward, but there seems to be a lot of people raising their hand coming forward, um, at least for this coming election. So um, I'd like to keep it, at least for now, as an elected position. Okay, I think we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 62 as presented, indicate by, by uh, saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Hmm. Let's stand one last time, maybe. All those in favor, stand and raise your green card. On the stage nine. Zero in the center back. Say that again. Zero in the center Zero back. Zero center rear. Three on the right. Three on the right. 17 on your left. 17 on the left. Center front seven. Center front seven.
Okay, those uh, opposed, please stand. Center front 20. Stage, I have the stage. Five. Five on the stage. On your left, 12. 12 on the left. On the right, 15. 15 on the right. In the center rear, 14. 14. 20, 40. 66. So it, it fails 66 to 36. Article 63, trustees of the school trust fund in the town of Hopkinton. Is there a trustee to make the motion? Debbie Finnerty, Debbie Finnerty, 17 Kimball Road, um, Chair of the Trustees of the School Fund, and we move that the following member be chosen to fill the vacancy now existing in the Board of uh, Trustees of the School Fund, Courtney Mallow, 7 West Elm Street, in Hopkinton. And is there a second? Any, any uh, explanation necessary? We, we have a vacancy and we need to have, we can only have up to seven people and we need you need a person. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, all those in favor of Article 63 as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, then it's unanimous. Final uh, annual town meeting motion, Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, we move that the annual town meeting adjourn until the date of the annual town election, May 15, 2017, held at the Hopkinton Middle School Gymnasium, and further, that the annual town meeting shall be dissolved upon the close of the polls on the date of the annual town election. Thank you. Thank you all for your uh, attendance, for your participation, and your diligence. Mr. And remember to vote. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, yes. can I just say an appreciation for the, the, the uh, appropriation committee for their report? Absolutely. I think, I think they did a wonderful job in a great way. Let's give them a round of applause. The fact that, they, that I was able to understand it. Thank you. Thank you.